Good morning. The September 14th, 2021 virtual work session of the Anne Arundel County Council is now in session. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Ms. Rodzian. Present. Ms. Hare. I can see Ms. Hare is here. Let's come back to her. Ms. Pickard. Present. Mr. Bolke. Mr. Bolke's not here yet. He did let me know he was uh, going to be a little bit late. Mr. Pruski. Here. Ms. Fiedler. Present. Ms. Lacey. I am present. Uh, Mr. Bolke, you have on the audit. <laughs> Find, finding the mute button again. Ms. Bolayer, our county auditor. Present. And Ms. Shewitt, Legislative Council. Present. Uh, Madam Chair, we have everyone except Mr. Volpe, who again is running a little bit late this morning. Ms. Hare, I can see is here. I believe she may be having some technical troubles. Okay. Madam Secretary, please read the Open Meetings Act statement. The Maryland Open Meetings Act is a state law that requires public meetings to be open to the public and to be held in places reasonably accessible to individuals who would like to attend these meetings. While a virtual meeting as of this type was not envisioned by the Open Meetings Act, steps have been taken to ensure that this virtual meeting includes alternate accessibility features that the Open Meetings Act Compliance Board and the courts have reviewed and approved, such as having a call-in phone number that allows anyone with a telephone to call and listen to the meeting, and broadcasting the meeting with video and audio on cable TV, the web, and through Zoom. The public access provided by this technology makes this virtual meeting reasonably accessible to the public as required by the Open Meetings Act. Thank you, Madam Secretary. We have two presentations on our agenda this morning. The first is concerning the Council Chamber's mural. We have the Arts Council. Ms. Anderson, are you going to introduce this um, presentation for us? Okay. I will start off and then I will turn it over to Ms. Nyman. That works. Uh, good morning. My name is Christine Anderson. I'm the director of the Office of Central Services. I'm very excited to be here today. Um, I know that a lot of you know the Office of Central Services as several divisions that make up the behind the scenes work. And today we're going to talk about actually a really exciting project. Um, as we were planning the security vestibule that is now opened just outside the, uh, the former windows of the council chambers, we knew we had an opportunity potentially to do something really special in the chambers itself. Uh, so we, the administration uh, approached April Nyman with the Arts Council, and we have partnered with the council to help bring some public art inside uh, not only the Arundel Center, the building, but also the chambers for all to see and enjoy. So we're very excited to be here and to show you where, where we're at now and where the project is likely to go. So with that, I will turn it over to Ms. Nyman. Good morning. I'm April Nyman. I'm the director for the Arts Council for the county and we're pleased to be here and thank you for allowing us this time. The Arts Council has had the pleasure of working with the county on several projects um, of public art over the past couple of years. And particularly as Christine said, we've been working with central services and um, to identify locations within the county throughout the entire county where we can issue calls for artists. And our role is to issue the calls for artists, um, have an online system for the submission. Recording in progress. And work through the jury system. Uh, and so that's our role in the part, this particular project for the um, mural in the county chambers. We had a call for artists, we had six submissions. And of those submissions, we selected one artist. On the jury for the um, for this project were Chris Trumbrauer, Laura Corby, Kelsey Schultz, Christine Anderson, and with the, uh, from our Arts Council board, Carol Alexander and Roberta Pardo. And with this, I'm going to turn it over to the star of the show for this event, uh, for this project, Sally Comport. Thank you, April. Very nice introduction. Thank you, council members. Thank you, uh, Laura, Christine, and uh, the Arts Council for putting us all together. 
Um, very appreciative of your time this morning. I'm going to share my screen and give you an overview of what we're thinking about for and where the space is located and give you an overview. So let me do that. Here we go. Um, hopefully everybody's clear on the screen. Um, I'm sharing the space um, that you will know all too well. Um, and we've, we've, uh, we've been given this wonderful canvas actually by um, the architectural redesign. And um, I'm pretty excited to um, fill it with a painting, a diptych, um, which is two paintings that are going to relate to each other. Um, this is just for position, um, but it also is, um, is a little bit of a, um, information about where I thought I would head, um, in celebrating the workforce of, um, Anne Arundel County and your volunteers and workforce, uh, in particular, um, in a, in a style that's mostly figurative where we celebrate, um, your community our community. Um, I've been in this community uh, making art for a long time. Um, I um, have a firm that employs two artists um, in, a, uh, in Annapolis. So um, here's a list of possibly some figures that might be included in our workforce. I am viewing this as the left side um, being more historically referenced um, with historically um, referenced and informed um, images of watermen, of uh, uh, government leaders. I'm, I'm particularly moving to the historic part of that, um, business leaders historically, um, and probably others, um, possibly even in our performers, artists. And then as we continue to move into the right side of this diptych painting, um, I am envisioning um, some future generations of um, our leaders and workforce. And um, we might show them in terms of um, performers, educators, also um, a nod to our um, senior volunteers, our service people, and the and um, in particular um, the things that make Anne Arundel County um, a distinctive and distinct workforce. Um, this was based on a similar project we did for the city of Annapolis, celebrating the workforce in Eastport on the Eastport fence. Um, I think which will be re-erected again to celebrate the Charter 300. So you can get a sense of the style of the work in which I um, do uh, some of my work. This was a California uh, um, business, um, nonprofit business um, that put uh, non-unionized uh, people uh, and uh, put them to work in off hours. Um, a similar um, organization um, that was called um, hmm, Organizing the Disenfranchised. Um, you may recognize this if you've been in and out of Annapolis on the Lighthouse uh, uh, Bistro on West Street. Um, and again, this has some historical reference and then brings it into the modern age for the mission of the Lighthouse. Um, and a book on uh, American poetry, poetry, much of my art will be seen in publication um, as an illustrator for 45 years. Uh, this was American um, poetry, Walt Whitman's great, I Hear America Singing. Sally, please exclude, um, excuse my interruption here. I just wanted to point out that your slides don't seem to be advancing. I want to see if there's something I can do to help out here. Um, oh. And I'd like to, to, I'd mostly like the council to be able to see your wonderful uh, artwork. 
Oh my. Okay. So uh, go ahead. Give try to give it an advance here. Move move. Uh, just scroll through the the PDF that you've created and see if it moves for you. If not, I'll bring it up for you and we can get mm -hmm. back to the, the right point here. I am scrolling now. Okay. So it's not working. All right. Do me a favor and click stop sharing. Okay. Apologies. It's okay. Sometimes this happens. So I think you were talking about this slide a moment ago. These are the wonderful, uh, some of the wonderful artwork you have put together. Is that correct? Yes. And this is just a position only slide. This is not our sketch or cartoon for the council chamber. This is uh, simply for position. So you could see how figurative representation might fit into this space. And then this was some of the uh, the ideas that we had discussed. I just want to get to the right spot here. Yes, exactly. Um, um, this this was the Eastport piece that celebrates the Eastport workforce um, historically for the Charter 300 for Annapolis and for a nonprofit in California. And similarly, for the same nonprofit in California, um, organizing the disenfranchised. And again, a piece that you will recognize um, possibly from the Lighthouse Bistro gives you a sense of scale um, on this piece. Um, I am very used to working in scale with public art pieces. Um, and institutional uh, art pieces. Um, so I have translated my illustrative style uh, that I do for many publications, books and publishers, advertising and institutions, and I've translated it to a large scale on walls. This is a reproduction only. The piece that I envision for the council chambers will be a painting. And at some point I am going to invite the, those that participated in the jury and others um, from the council, if you are interested to see the work in process at our studio um, where my firm is in uh, on West Street. And again, uh, let's see, Laura won. Uh, this is from the wonderful poem by Walt Whitman, I Hear America Singing, um, published in 2000. And not sure where we are. Uh, you may also recognize this one of Anna Catherine Green. It is um, large scale, sitting uh, um, above the Western uh, West Street corridor there uh, on the Severn Bank building. And that concludes um, some samples and examples of how I might treat a figurative representation. I'm open to your comments, questions, or um, whatever. Thank you very much, Ms. Comfort. That was a lovely presentation, and it's very exciting to think about there being any color and illustration in our, in our chambers. <laughs> uh, Ms. Ravian, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I have to say one of the things that I really wanted to, I was hoping to see reflected in whatever is on um, those two spaces is the diversity of the community. And I appreciate that that's captured in your artwork. Thank you. Yes, very, very uh, much so. I want to offer uh, age, race, um, figurative uh, differences, everything. So yes. Anyone else? Hearing none, well, Ms. Pickard. I have to get used to all my settings again. I just wanted to ask um, a more process question. So what is the timeline? Because it is really exciting <laughs> for the whole project. Well, I was given a fairly open timeline, but I am going to try to get this um, into the chamber and, and installed um, between the Christmas and New Year holiday. Um, and I am thinking that we can possibly do a studio visit 
um, somewhere in November, it's possibly mid-November. Thank Field you. Trip. Love it. <laughs> Anybody else? All right, seeing none, please uh, keep up the great and exciting work. Thank you so much for taking the time to give us an update this morning. Thank you for the time. Appreciate your time. And uh, Ms. Anderson, you're staying because we have a second presentation with you, County Procurement Reform 2016 to the present. Yes, ma'am. Good morning again. I'm Christine Anderson. I am the Director of the Office of Central Services. Joining me is Andrew Heim, the County Purchasing Agent. Uh, we are here this morning because we um, know that there is some interest in our, uh, our progress in being able to make the procurement process more efficient. It's always a struggle to balance the, um, the need to protect the taxpayer and the funds that they give us to provide them services with getting things done in a reasonable time frame. So what we're going to talk about today is just that. Um, Laura or Kaylee, do you have the presentation to put up? I do. I'm happy to bring that up. Just give me one if moment. If you don't mind, that, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, let's do that. Okay, Christine, it is all yours. If it helps you to just ask me to advance, I can do that too. All right, if you don't mind, that will keep me yeah. on track. So on slide two, I wanted to explain a little bit of the background, how we got here. Um, how did we start reforming the procurement process? Because procurement is one of those things that is a backbone of government, but it tends to be uh, not looked at until people are upset that it's not going fast enough or the outcome isn't what they wanted. So in 2015, the county brought in Ernst & Young um, e y as we refer to them, to evaluate the services. They did a very fast look. They looked at how we were structured, what the laws were like, as well as what they thought the future state, what the future should be or could be based on some other governmental models, but primarily the private sector models. Um, they gave us a very high level uh, five-year roadmap with some targets for savings, with six different areas to work on and focus on. Um, and they gave us a few metrics so that we could see how we were doing along that five-year path. Uh, what wasn't included was a, a focus on increasing minority business participation, women businesses, small businesses, veterans, or local business spending. So that work has continued over the last five years, but you won't see much mention of it in here. Um, they didn't do a national benchmark study to sort of determine what were the appropriate benchmarks we should be looking at. Again, there are some differences, intentional differences with private business. We cannot always be as nimble because we do need to have the, the fair process, the open process to ensure that any business that can compete should be given that opportunity to get county dollars, to get county work. Um, we also launched a communication program that was not something that EY had recommended, um, but we felt that across the county, um, agency staff needed to know what we were doing and where where they could go to get more information or where they could learn more to do a little bit on the front end to make the whole procurement process go better and more efficient. Uh, and we were actually recognized in the last five years by the National Institute of Government Procurement with an outstanding agency accreditation award for this work. So we're very excited about it. Um, Laura, if you can go to slide three, I'll talk a little bit about some of the major findings in the report. Um, not surprising, I think, to some, procurement is considered a bottleneck by some other agencies and that sometimes there could be inconsistencies or lack of understanding about why different processes were handled differently. Um, definitely, I mean, identified a need to simplify things and be more strategic um, rather than just handling the piece of work in front of us and only doing that. Think more broadly about what's going on in county government across multiple agencies. Um, and some of our policies reinforced re the inefficiencies. The, well, we need that form and triplicate and it's gotta be hard copy and it's gotta be, you know, just that the old style of thinking about things. And the agencies do play a role in the in procurements. Not every procurement needs to go through the purchasing division and the, those that do, if an agency is more clear up front about what they're trying to buy, then that process makes the process go smoother. But there were major misunderstandings and lack of information I mean, those were some of the, the findings. What that told us, we definitely had a lot of work to do to streamline that operation. Um, on slide four, there's a few other things, though, that came up as a result of that. It did give us a roadmap for the last six years, really, 
um, gave us some good private business practices that we could implement in a government um, in the government sector and it helped really refine what we were going to work on over the five years. However, some of the things I mentioned aren't really suitable to the public um, and really the study method itself was aggressive and unapologetic and it created uh, some negative culture in the purchasing division where if the staff are told in a public report and repeated in the paper by people that matter, by their colleagues and other agencies, that you're slow, you're inefficient, you don't care, that makes it hard to wanna to come to work every day and do your best. So we worked very hard and we continue to work very hard on improving morale, ensuring that staff know that the work they're doing isn't just a buying something. It's making sure the firefighter has the tool he needs to respond to an incident. It's making sure that police officer has the tools they need, the car, the computer equipment, the uniform, whatever it is. It's making sure that DPW has what they need, recreation and parks, every facet of government can be impacted positively or negatively by our buyers. And they needed to see their place in the role, they, in the roles that they play, and they needed to understand how important they were and how valued they were. This study left out the value part. And so we really struggled to make the process easier for our buyers to do the work, but also in a way that makes them understand that they're critical and valued and important, and they shouldn't be blamed necessarily for something that goes wrong. So, um, so with that, what I would like to do is turn this over to Andrew, um, Andrew Heim, who will go through more specifically the, um, the study itself, some of the findings, and some of the great successes we have had so far. Andrew? Excellent. Well, thank you, Christine. Very much appreciated. Uh, again, Andrew Heim, purchasing agent for the county. We can go ahead and uh, move to the next slide. Uh, what I'm going to cover here to, right now is uh, we talk about the uh, areas of recommendation. These are really the, the uh, we say five, that kind of includes uh, the change management component as well, because that's more of the how you actually implement it. But the, the areas of recommendation uh, that EY focused on in that, and then these would be, be the 30,000 foot view of the major points that need to be accomplished in creating procurement reform. So again, very helpful information. Uh, we can, we'll be getting into the status of those uh, as we go on a little bit further here. But uh, the first one, organization and operation uh, model design, that's restructuring how the purchasing operation works and where the different people sit, what functions they do and how that's gonna be successful. Redoing policy and procedures is really looking at, again, that efficiency component of it, looking at what is gonna provide the most value, what is the best process that's still gonna hold compliance but get us to the solution get us the firefighters goods and services as quickly as possible, get the other agencies the goods and services as quickly as possible. Uh, technology and automation is again, what can we do to take a process that six years ago was really a paper and pen, everything, you know, print it out, uh, digital, physically sign it process and turn it into a really uh, well-structured digitally automated system uh, and connecting it with our ERP system as well as other, you know, functional needs across the county. Uh, then you get into category management and sourcing. This is a, a really um, a key concept of, of efficient Two organizations within the uh, public sector have been able to efficiently do this and, and bring, up, bring upon uh, category management and strategic sourcing. Um, but it is something that we were able to do and, and do quite well. Uh, we do uh, process re-engineering, again, thinking through the concept of what are those procurement step processes and how do we create a more streamlined aspect of those procurement processes? And again, as I mentioned, it's the change management. It's how do we go ahead and make sure that we take those processes and really get create buy-in not only with the agencies and with the stakeholders, but also create buy-in with our staff and make sure that we move forward with delivering on these products. So, all right, if we can go ahead and move to the next slide. Again, one of the things that you'll find with the key recommendations is what, um, what were the key things that we established as goals of, the, of implementing these recommendations? We need to shorten the procurement cycle time. That was a, a, a key metric that we looked at when we first started this effort. We wanted to make sure that we redesigned the, the regulations, the laws, the purchasing manual, take out the non-value add steps, take that in not only in the legislative uh, efforts we did with the Article 8 um, restructuring, but also re redesigning the purchasing manual to be more value add and focused on delivering the most efficient process possible. Uh, and again, then creating the uh, savings, the target that, that EY put in place, and I think they even said that, you know, we'll help you in making sure you can accomplish this if you want to pay us to do it. 
Uh, but it was, you know, can you achieve $20 million in a five-year time frame? They, they use metrics associated with the total spend, the, the frequency, and the total transactions to try and come up with a, a target goal for that. Uh, and then again, instituting that category management uh, in leveraging the, the procurement buying power of the, of the county, since we are between $400 and $500 million on average of procurement spend a year, trying to figure out how to best leverage that and, and get the best value. Uh, and reorganizing the staff model to, to really follow similar uh, private sector models and developing and launching our IT sys uh, a, a procurement system that is fully digital and, and works in kind of cutting edge IT industry uh, requirements for procurement. So those are some of the key recommendations out of it. And there's a lot more details behind it, but that kind of is again, the high level goals of the project. We can move to the next slide, please. All right, so let's talk about the status. Uh, we have, we're very excited to be able to report that we've met our metrics in a lot, in I'd say all of our categories. We are a little short on our technology and automation, and I'll be happy to give you some more details behind that. But uh, with our restructuring to our organizational model and our operating model, we've done the restructuring to, to meet that requirement. We've implemented the changes in policies and procedures. We've redesigned those. We have the purchasing regulations now that are now, you know, again, a, a massive effort to redesign that and work with key stakeholders to get their buy-in and create the, uh, the, the legal process of how we go about doing these procurements, in addition to rewrites of Article 8 uh, of the county code to be able to make sure that we are strategically and effectively addressing any changes that need to be made there as well. Uh, again, you'll see uh, in technology and automation, we've done a, a lot of that, a lot of the efficiencies we've gone, and I'll, I'll be giving you a full summary of the technology and automation accomplishments, but uh, at a high level, you know, we've, we've really done some, some tremendous things. I'm excited to be able to share those with you. We do have some areas that are still in progress, and I'll also be able to give you some status on how those are going. Category management and sourcing. Again, we're very excited about that. We have a great category management manager, uh, Dale Usler, who works with us and is uh, really great at creating a pipeline of procurement workload to come through and, and leverage that spend and come up with strategic ways to uh, to come up with a more strategic way to buy something or as well as what can we do to get better uh, a better pricing and create savings or efficiency through that process. And again, process re-engineering, we've gone through and we've done that. We've redesigned our processes to be as, as efficient as possible while still staying compliant with laws and regulations. Uh, and really, again, the change management, although it's been very challenging uh, coming through and making sure that this is a, a buy-in that we're doing with not only the stakeholders, uh, within the county, the different departments and agencies that we work with, but also creating the buy-in with our own staff and our team members. And really, again, creating that value that they see in what they do every day, showing that the changes are really building towards a more efficient and better process for uh, not only them, but the entire organization. It's something that, again, I'm, I'm proud to report today that we have, we've met that requirement. We can move to the next slide, please. All right, so now we're going to talk in a little bit more detail. I've got highlights here of the, the different major accomplishments in each section. Uh, I'll hit some highlights in here, and then I'll be more than happy to uh, answer anything that you guys may have questions on. Uh, but in the organizational operating model, we really did a deep dive into redesigning the organizational staff structure. We redesigned and created uh, positions for a category management manager who leads category management for our organization, as well as a procurement strategy manager that is ideally just focused in on what is, where are we at today? Where can we continue to grow and continue to create not only policies and procedures and desktop guides, but create more streamlined continuous improvement process? Uh, we've uh, created organizational communication structures. We've created guiding principles and mission statements to help our staff understand and take ownership and responsibility for the work that they're doing. Uh, we've developed processes and analytics behind what we do to be able to measure and understand where continued uh, improvement is needed and be able to address it become, before it becomes a snowballing process. Uh, and we've also been able to develop uh, guiding performance metrics to help staff understand what goals they should try and achieve, especially as we bring new staff on board so they can get a measurement of, here's where I'm at today, here's where I can continue to, continue to grow and what can I do to do better as I continue to, to grow in my skills and capabilities. Uh, and then again, we've launched internal, and uh, internal trainings with our staff and with our external agencies to help them understand that internal relationship that Christine was talking about of how do they uh, contribute to making sure that procurement process is, a, is as efficient as possible. And none of the policies and procedures, I won't hit all of these because I've kind of talked about a, a good amount of them all together, but uh, we did create a delegation of authority. We obviously did do the rewrite to the purchasing to create the purchasing regulations. Uh, we redesigned our procurement contracts and, uh, and, and templates for our solicitations to be more uh, effective and efficient 
and also to be a little bit easier to understand. And we're continuing to do that on an ongoing basis as we continue to grow and reform. Um, and then as we uh, look at uh, different policies and checklists we've created, again, trying to create some more standardizing of how we do a standardized process each and every time so that there's not inconsistencies in how we approach it, uh, that we create checklists for our staff and for uh, an internal agency so we can create uh, a uniform process and help to make sure that we're making sure our compliance is as high as it can possibly be. All right, we'll go ahead and move on to the next slide. There we go. All right, technology and automation. Uh, we launched our first ever electronic signature process. That was a, it took a long time to get there, but uh, executing things electronically when you when you were doing it, uh, you know, five and a half, six years ago, uh, literally hand carrying contracts from one agency to the next to the, to the next person was such a huge accomplishment. Uh, reducing the manuals, uh, you know, process associated with that, and then streamlining our PO process. And we're continuing to streamline our PO process, but. Uh, removing out, we used to have color-coded prints that had to go out and had to be filed with different processes. We streamlined that. Uh, we've also launched our first e-procurement system. This was a, a massive undertaking that we did not only in RF5 for, but in RFP, uh, and really designing that cradle to grave. And we've moved entirely to a digital operation. Uh, we were able to do that prior to the beginning of COVID-19, and I will say it's been a huge uh, opportunity for us to continue to um, create more efficiency because we've been able to do all of our procurement process uh, digitally. Uh, so it's just a major accomplishment for our team and for our county as a whole. Uh, category management and sourcing, again, uh, very excited to report on the, the methodologies and the processes that are behind that have been utilized and implemented. We've started that early on and we've, been, we've seen tremendous growth in it. Some of the metrics that help show and demonstrate that are the fact that we have uh, over $29 million in savings in a five year period, far surpassing the $20 million goal uh, which we we met and exceeded in a little over four years. Uh, developing a first and second wave approach to our procurement uh, category management sourcing processes, which is how can we look at what we're buying initially and then what can we do from a sourcing perspective to not only look at that first time buy, but what can we do to look at the uh, additional supplemental or ancillary items that may go along with it? What can we do to, to create that second wave approach of uh, ensuring that our, our procurement needs uh, are not only getting the category management focus and, and strategy, but also what other repercussions are gonna come from that? So what can we do to think about not only where we're at today, but where we're gonna be at in the future? Uh, and again, checklists and process behind that. Uh, and then again, implementing taxonomy, because as, uh, as we implement uh, more procurement reform and an integration of our e-procurement system with uh, the Workday solution and our new ERP system, taxonomy of having the, the identification of what those transactions are with a code that says this is for this type of group of spend and this is for this type of spend is really gonna help us to be able to analyze the data in more detail and be able to come up with more types of ways to report out on things and uh, have the tools and resources to be able to, to understand our spend and be able to report or, or create change, uh, continuous change in the future. We can move forward with the next slide, please. Process re-engineering, again, we've been able to look at, break down every single one of our processes. It's one of the first things we did when, when I came on board with the county is literally sitting down and remapping using a PMP process methodology, looking at each step in the phase of what we do. And again, it's something that we look at it and say, we're not just gonna do it once, we're gonna continue to keep doing it. We're gonna keep looking at how we can continue to grow our process and create reform. And by creating our own policies and procedures to standardize the RFP process, the IFB process, we're reducing the possibility that there's inconsistencies in the way this buyer approaches it and this buyer approaches it, but it's still consistent and legal, but we can create the efficiency and streamline that process. And again, being able to streamline not only that, but our, our tasks and our assignment responsibilities, uh, creating that in policies and procedures that our team develops and, and understanding that and building that into our regulations and processes at a, at a legal level and a legislative level has been really a, a tremendous success and a, a partnership we've worked out with many key stakeholders, agencies and the executive, as well as the county council in the past. So it's really been a success story of that, that work, that collaborative work with all those groups. And then change management again is, uh, as Christine pointed out, we started in on this with a, a, a way that the uh, evaluation was done, uh, but we've triumphed despite the fact that we've had uh, challenges along the way. And I think that's, you know, you come in and somebody comes in and says, hey, there's there's ways you need to reform. And I think we've all kind of adapted to that, that methodology or that mindset of, if we can find new ways that we can continue to grow and continue to become more efficient and streamline our process in the future, 
that's the attitude and the approach that we're going to continue to keep taking. And I think that's something that continuous improvement process, building that and building that through the last five years and setting that tone and creating that value statement for our organization is what's going to drive us to continue to reform as we continue to grow. Okay. All right. So let's move on to our next slide. Legislative procurement reform. Uh, so one of the things that, you know, I wanted to just put a slide together on this, just talking about some of the different things that we've been able to do through legislation, partnership with our uh, executive leadership, as well as partnership with uh, county council to be able to increase not only transparency, but also uh, to try and up update purchasing regulations, laws, uh, county charter, our small procurement threshold, which we'll be talking about in a little bit more detail. Uh, but really, it's it's increasing the uh, efficiency behind how we procure, how we process things, uh, and then being able to update, um, you know, things that were uh, kind of outdated or, or needed to be um, thought through and, and come up with the more strategic and legal and compliant ways to address it. Uh, things like our mandatory contract clauses, uh, streamlining the formal procurement steps in the administrative process, ensuring that we're still meeting those thresholds, but coming up with how can we do this as efficiently and effectively as possible. Uh, and again, um, one of the things we focus on is what can we do to continue to do that while we're being transparent? How can we do that, continue to, to improve on our reporting capabilities uh, and lay the foundations for building a really strong uh, and, uh, and I would say a robust uh, minority, small, local business uh, program within the county. And I think that's one of the new, I would say new, but a couple of years initiatives that we've really started to strategically put not only metrics in place of now, but what are we doing over the next couple of years and in the future to continue to grow those efforts? Okay. All right, let's move on to the next slide. All right, so when one of the things that I know that is probably some, something that has come up in the past and I wanted to create a slide to kind of talk about it is the increase of the small procurement threshold. And I certainly understand and, and thank the County Council for, for all the participation and support we've gotten through that, but I think this might give some context of why we've done uh, the, the, these reform efforts in this specific area and the, and the outcome of that. Um, when we changed the small procurement threshold to, uh, from $50,000 to $100,000, even though the impact of that was really only about 8.2% uh, of the total annual procurements, it also created some strategic uh, redesign of how we're doing things and is creating more benefit of not only how we're streamlining that procurement process in certain areas and, and taking a little bit of that area of, of workload away, it also is helping to grow in a lot of other initiatives that we're working towards. So I tried to come up with an analogy that might make sense behind this, but um, when you think of the procurement efforts that we're working on right now, um, the, the concept of looking at, you know, investing in that small procurement threshold increase is certainly a level of efficiency, but, it, and I would equate it on a, on a uh, you know, Formula One uh, vehicle, you think of it as new tires and wheels that you're putting on your vehicle. It's going to, it's going to help you stay on the road faster, better, and more efficient, but it's not going to increase your horsepower. It's not going to make you operate any faster, any more efficient, other than just that the stability, the, the, the better operation from that component. It does have some efficiency levels and, and will help you maybe get that extra hair edge on your competition. Uh, and in this case, you know, it helps us with that little bit of efficiency in, in reducing the procurement workload a little bit that 8.2%, but what it really does is help to build that future race car, that future high-end performing machine that we are growing towards as we continue to move forward. So I wanna also thank you and the council and the executive uh, branch for uh, really investing in us in the future and doing that uh, with the additional staff positions. And I wanted to give that as, think of that analogy as, you know, that's like kind of buying a new engine for, for uh, your Formula F1 car, because ultimately what you're doing is you're investing in horsepower, resources, throughput, additional capabilities to build the staff and the bench strength of our organization and building a long-term structure of how can we ensure that we're meeting all of the high demand operations that we're currently working on and continuing to grow on. So, all right, with anything like that, I'll be happy to keep talking cars and vehicles. I love to do that, but I will, I will move on to the next slide. Um, one of the things I, I know, and I, I want to give credit, uh, one of the things I would like to come before whenever I'm, I'm meeting with council is have some metrics to be able to share. Uh, one of the things that we looked at when we started looking at staffing levels and why we wanted to back up and support this, and I'm sure you may have seen these numbers before, uh, but one of the things we wanted to show is looking at the average of what the volume of procurements, the dollar amount of procurement responsibility, and looking at that in comparison with our government organization in, in comparison with other local jurisdictions that have similar spend and similar demands. 
So again, if you can see what we were doing previously with nine buyers uh, is tremendous. If you look at the amount of procurement transactions and responsibility and dollars responsible for, for an individual procurement uh, professional within our organization, comparing that with Baltimore City, Howard County, Montgomery County, uh, Anne Arundel County Public Schools, you know, again, one of the things that we, we would try to look with this is these are the data we went to these jurisdictions to so tell us your data and give us your, your, your specifics of what you're doing. And I will say it's something, it's been a very exciting road because a lot of the jurisdictions now are also having these same type of internal discussions. Uh, Baltimore uh, County reached out to me and, uh, you know, is, is interested in doing their procurement reform. So they're just now kind of kicking off that effort. Uh, and they've been interested in, you know, understanding that and what the next steps they're going to be doing. So uh, I think this is a perfect example of, you know, putting the, the metrics behind uh, not only the methodologies and the process, but showing the workflow. Any questions on that? All right, I think we can move to the next slide then. All right, uh, talking about the technology and automation, I think it's something, like I said, we, we really want to uh, point out that we've done tremendous uh, efforts. We are uh, we, we try and, and not only do market one of the things, or one of the efficiencies behind what we've been doing now is we've invested in technology, uh, not only for our procurement process, but our intelligence, right? So what do you do to be able to make sure that every procurement professional comes to bear on every single procurement need with the most amount of data and resources to be able to use third party um, un unbiased data to be able to, to uh, have market intelligence and understanding of how to help that agency with their specific procurement need. So we've invested in technology associated with that uh, so that our buyers, when they're ready to do their next procurement, can have a full picture of what the market in that area does, can come prepared to solve some of the most major challenges that the county uh, needs have, or that it could be highly te technical or high, uh, high requirements, uh, but investing behind that and having some baseline knowledge so our procurement professionals at least are able to, to have a baseline understanding of what they're getting ready to do uh, before they go forward with it. And sometimes in major technology, procure in major procurements, sometimes there's more expertise we still need. And sometimes the market intelligence tool says that, you know, in the context of, uh, you know, multi-million dollar solicitations, sometimes we do need a subject matter expert to come in and be an advisor on that process. But having that market intelligence capability and, and understanding and understanding of what pricing, um, industry pricing is for those uh, products really does help us in, in stepping forward with that first step as effectively and efficiently as possible. And we've also implemented, um, you know, again, uh, the implementation of the e-procurement system has really gone very well, except for the fact that we have not completed the integration with our e-procurement system and our financial system, our E1 system. And that still created some challenges for us along the way. And really, I will say it creates, creates uh, extra burden and workload for our team, as well as it creates an extra burden and workload for our uh, county agencies. It's a it's a long road coming, but we are very um, we're, we're taking a positive approach with this. We're looking at the positives of the fact that with the workday implementation, we've got a good plan in place with the stakeholders with an OIT as well as with the implementation company to be able to remedy that and really create some massive efficiency in the future. Uh, and I will say, you know, it has ampered our ability to be able to, you know, be able to create the massive efficiency we kind of hope to be able to accomplish beforehand. And that's why when I say that I'm reporting out on, on completion of those procurement reform efforts, we still kept that at about an 87% complete component. Uh, and that's really where we see that continuing to uh, be completed when we get through the next 12 months with our, um, with our ERP implementation of work there. Um, any other uh, comments on technology? All right, so I think we can go to the next slide, please. So I also want to leave you guys with the concept of where we're at today and what's coming up next. Uh, so if you look at what we've what we've done so far in, in the fact that we're still kind of in this transition stage to our e-procurements, our connection with our, our workday implementation, we've developed a homegrown tracking tool to monitor and, and centralize all of the procurement requests coming in. And part of that is to not only be able to create the metrics that we need behind it to increase the number of reports we're able to release, but also to, to have better understanding because in, in years past, procurement requests would come in as a, a fax copy, an email, a phone call. It would come in from a variety of different sources and processes. So we're streamlining that, making sure that we have a central place to keep and report all that information and to be able to monitor the progress of where those things are going on to be able to give better structure to our management team and ensuring that, that procurements are com being completed effectively and efficiently and avoiding that, this could snowball for a long period of time. Um, 
and we're routing uh, contracts uh, right now, actually, in effect, uh, since, I, since I wrote this uh, PowerPoint and since I'm here with you today, we have executed our disparity study contract and looking for a kickoff uh, in the near future, I'll, I'll coordinate that, but it is uh, just recently executed and uh, looking forward to beginning that process. It will take a long time to complete, but uh, it's, a, it's a major step in our growth of, our, uh, of our, where we're going as a county and where our procurement process is going to incorporate not only the small, local, minority, service disabled, veteran owned businesses, uh, and really focus in on veteran and veteran owned businesses, but focus in on what we can do to continue to create continuous reform and process behind uh, ensuring that our procurement processes also address the needs of those, those groups and that they're still compliant and legal and appropriate. Okay. Um, and then we're also, um, you know, in the process of prevailing wage, we're gonna be talking about that later on today. Uh, doing certified payroll, creating a structure and program behind the, the prevailing wage program. That's going to be a huge benefit to a lot of different constituents. And not only that, but uh, coming up with a concept of how we implement that. And then how do you manage it? How do you operate it? And so that's been a challenge that we've been excited to tackle and work with different key stakeholders within the, the, the county departments on. Um, and we're also very excited about the DBE transportation program, which we've stood up, uh, have our first solicitation out and are looking to try and um, have a successful result of that as well, which is, again, a massive effort to stand up an operation, a program, a reporting structure behind it, but we're, we're very excited to take on that challenge. And then launching, um, again, a, 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 the, one of the things that I'm, I'm focused on in the next year, uh, and actually in the next couple of months we'll be starting this, is uh, starting the issue of procurement forecasts. And that was actually feedback we got from the vendor community, from the small minority uh, vendor, local owned uh, community, interested in getting a better feel for I know you can't tell me when this procurement is specifically going to be released, but it would be really helpful for me as a small business to understand a rough time frame. Are you thinking the next six months? Are you thinking a year from now? So coming up with a forecast that we can issue once every six months to kind of keep people informed on what's on the horizon, what are new procurements coming forward with? And that's kind of, again, one of our next strategic efforts we're gonna to continue to, to move forward with. All right. All right, so that's, that, I think that might be the last slide. Can, yeah, I think that's the last one. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Heim. It was a highly detailed presentation, and um, I'm sure my colleagues may not have all their questions ready right now, but we know how to contact you. So whoever does, uh, Ms. Fiedler, go ahead. Thank you. I was just going to thank everybody for the presentation this morning and request a copy of the presentation. I didn't see it in the file. Thank you. Anybody else with um, questions or feedback? Um, I'll just say excellent work to you both, Ms. Anderson and Mr. Heim. Um, you certainly have a heck of a lot to do. So I feel like I need my second cup of coffee now to uh, go on to the next part of the meeting. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you for your time. We appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. All right, Madam Secretary, I believe we are moving on to bill number 6721. Is that right? Yes, Madam Chair, that is on the agenda. I assume you're going to go in the order of the agenda. If you're going to do anything different, I think you just need to uh, discuss it amongst the council. Okay, nope, that was my plan. I didn't know if anybody else had a preference to hear things in a different order, but if you do, just speak up. Okay, Bill 6721. Um, I see Mr. Batsaris. Good morning, Michael Batsaris here, Executive Director, Athens Commission. Good morning, and Mr. Swain and Ms. Klassmeyer. Um, so we last left this with the hearing concluded and we were discussing um, how we as a council could perhaps work with the ethics commission to tailor this bill in a, in a bit of a different way. Um, anybody who would like to uh, lead off on a conversation about that, please feel free to raise your hand or call my name to be recognized. If I can proceed, Madam Chair. Go ahead, Mr. Bretzeris. 
Um, I just want to report that we did have a commission meeting last night. It was our normal regular commission meeting. I did bring this topic up to the commission uh, again to discuss it. And the commission again unanimously re reiterated their desire to see an FDS statement from this particular county government position. Um, they looked at the conflict of interest statement as an alternative. And after reviewing it, they rejected that idea because it does only apply to board and commission members. It does not apply to employees. And so they feel that the financial disclosure statement is the appropriate form uh, that they need as one of their tools to enforce the, uh, the ethics code. Okay, uh, Mr. Bolke. Thank you, Madam Chair, Nathan Bolke, District 3. Mr. Baxaris, following up on that, was there any additional discussion about whether it would make sense for the uh, Office of Law attorneys, all of them, to also file the financial disclosure statement vis-a-vis -vis the conflict of interest form since, as you just noted, the conflict of interest is usually for boards and commissions, not for employees? Yes, uh, Councilman Bolke, we did discuss your amendment um, and the commission uh, unanimously did not believe it was necessary to include all county attorneys since we already include the county attorney and all deputy attorneys that they feel have the managerial and oversight function that needs, uh, that should be disclosed. Uh, that the reason being that they should have to disclose the uh, financial information on the disclosure uh, report. Um, and they noted the fact that the attorneys in the office of law are still covered by the county ethics code and also still covered by the uh, Maryland state uh, attorney professional code of conduct. So they didn't feel it was necessary. Anyone else? We have a quiet bunch this morning. And I'll tell you, they were a little confused as to why we thought this was a fairly simple matter. Um, when we originally brought it to Madam Chair and decided to ask her to um, sponsor it, um, it seemed like it was a pretty uh, done deal as a simple matter of more disclosure as opposed to less disclosure. And they're a little confused as to why there's so much pushback on having an additional financial disclosure statement being filed by a county employee who is in a position uh, to interpret, to draft, and to comment on legislation, who is also in a position to practice law privately and is allowed to maintain a private practice of law, unlike any other attorney in the county administration. Mr. Volke? Thank you, Madam Chair. Law. So Mr. In Swain progress. and I have gone back and forth on that. Um, and I see him here on the call after our meeting, uh, not this week, but last week. And I think that there's an agreement that maybe a separate standalone bill would be necessary to provide a prohibition on any attorneys in the county office of law from maintaining an outside practice because the charter actually uh, really only does apply to the county attorney uh, him or herself not to everyone else so has the ethics commission considered that piece of that the um, financial disclosure statement you know is that fact known to them um, and then what if any I'm not sure whether you would weigh in on that or not, the uh, the outside practice piece, but yeah, if, you, I mean, if you have any comments. I would defer to Mr. Swain on, on that particular issue. I mean, I think they have a policy regarding that. I think it's been effective uh, to date. Um, I think there was that executive order that was passed in the previous administration. I think it can be handled by another executive order if this administration felt something different, but again, you know, Mr. Swain, as the county attorney, uh, I would defer his discretion on those issues. This is Sarah Lacey, District 1. I just, I'm going to throw this out there for my colleagues. I'm planning to uh, prepare an amendment this week that, if adopted, would make 
the uh, legislation take effect for whoever is the legislative council as of the beginning of the next term of the county council. So I feel it's um, an important consideration to uh, not unduly interfere with or otherwise alter our existing attorney-client relationship unless four of us want to do that. But I think that hasn't been the expectation for a long time. And as I expressed at our um, previous meeting discussing this bill, I think there are multiple other layers of protection that are already in place. Um, and so while I don't, I don't actually oppose the idea of having the legislative council, whoever that is, have to file a financial disclosure, I don't think it should be uh, something that is forced by statute on our current legislative council. Does anyone else have a comment or a question or discussion about Bill 6721? Hearing crickets, uh, thank you all. We'll move on to Bill 6821. This is the animal care and control bill, tethering of dogs. Mr. Barron, good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the County Council. Um, joining me again at the virtual table is uh, Ms. Catlett, Captain Adams, and Mr. Ritter. Um, we discussed this bill at length uh, at the previous council meeting. Uh, there have been continuing discussions uh, with several members of the county council. Um, we were hoping to get some draft uh, amendment language for us to react to um, today, um, but we were not able to get something ready. But uh, to sort of highlight the, the direction that uh, the administration and the conversations that we've had, um, particularly with Councilwoman Rodby and, and Councilwoman Fiedler. Um, uh, there were two major issues, um, sort of the, the age of uh, the person um, required to be on, on the property, and if there was any flexibility uh, in allowing, um, uh, I, I don't want to say momentarily, but brief um, periods of uh, where the, the individual who's responsible for the animal doesn't have to be physically outside with the animal. Um, we are working on, on language that hopefully will, um, as I said to Councilwoman Rodby, and thread the needle uh, to make sure that we that the law is clear that we are not um, grabbing, uh, you know, in, in Councilwoman Robin's example, her good owner, and that this law is clarifying and, and making it clear that we can enforce the law against um, people who abuse and neglect their, their animals. Uh, the, uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that, and, and we're happy to answer any questions, and hopefully, uh, by tomorrow or Thursday, we're starting to float draft language um, in advance of uh, the council meeting. Ms. Schuett. Thank you, Madam Chair. Linda Schuett, Legislative Council. I have a question about how the first and the second sentences relate to each other. So the first sentence says you just, you can't generally tie up a dog unless you need to in order to do a temporary task or to allow the dog to exercise or defecate. In, with respect to that sentence alone, do you also need to have an 18 year old or older person within the line of sight? Or is that meant to allow that kind of activity without having a, an 18 year old present or older? Pete Barron with the administration, I'll, I'll defer the Office of Law. If I think what uh, you're getting at, Madam Legislative Council, is um, our, our the bill is drafted before we bring forward any uh, amendments. The intent was to have in a responsible adult, um, somebody 18 or older with a uh, line of sight. 
Uh, yes, Kern Ritter with the Office of Law. So the first sentence is essentially the general prohibition on tethering and then carves out the situation in which it would be allowed. And after that, it goes into the conditions that would be placed on that tethering when it is allowed by that first sentence. So you would need to have the person 18 years or old, of age or older outdoors with the dog. Um, it wouldn't be allowed during the certain temperature restrictions and obviously the uh, prohibition on allowing the restraint to wrap or tangle around the dog's neck or limbs would also apply there. Thank you. Count, uh, Madam Chair, if I may. Go ahead. Uh, Pete Barron with the administration. Uh, Ms. Shue, uh, as we get a draft ready, we will obviously include uh, you for review. Mr. Volke. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I had a question about this bill in relation to the last bill. Mr. Ritter, are you in a position in the Office of Law where you're required to file a financial disclosure statement? And I'm asking because if you heard this discussion on the last bill, there was some talk about who's in a position to advise the county council on what the law means and, and different interpretations. So I just want to understand that if I can. I'm only asking, I don't care anything about your, your financial disclosure, just if you're in a position where you have to do it. I am not, as an assistant county attorney, too. I do not have a requirement to file a financial disclosure. Okay, thank you. Ms. Fiedler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Amanda Fiedler, District 5. So, um, Ms. Catlett, um, I really appreciate the extensive conversation that we had last week. Um, and it seems like we are headed in the right direction to address some of my concerns. but. What I thought was very helpful in clarifying um, when the agency may impound, because I know we talked about setting a threshold for the amount of calls that would need to be received in order for an animal to be impounded. But what, what wasn't clear, at least for me in our public hearing, was that in a circumstance where a dog is tethered and a community is complaining, um, it is not actually the animal that is in violation, it is the human. And if you look at um, uh, for members of the public, the only other two opportunities or circumstances where an animal can be impounded is when it's um, potentially dangerous or a community cat, and that's an animal that wanders about. Um, and in that circumstance, obviously the cat is um, not, not tethered and the uh, owner is not making um, the decision, the cat's making the decision. So um, if you could just touch on that from a legal perspective, because that was an area I did um, investigate and it is challenging to overcome. Uh, I'll do my best, but really I think it, it may be better coming um, from, from Office of Law because that, um, what I relayed to you was, was my understanding of how it works, essentially in the particular case that um, really brought this bill forward is the situation where we have animals outside, we have people claiming they're supervising, and we as the enforcement agency cannot uh, prove without a doubt that they're not because the law doesn't require them to be outside and they're saying, well, I am inside or I'm supervising via my ring. I can see if something happens, I can get somebody there, or, you know, I'm upstairs or I'm, you know, wherever, and I can see. And so they're then not, um, we can't enforce the not tethering aspect at all of the situation because it's not the animal that's in violation. And what the law says is we can impound an animal that remains essentially in violation of the law, but it's not the animal. The animal's not running at large. The animal's not biting people. The animal itself is not doing anything. It's the lack of care from the owner. It's the lack of um, steps that the owner needs to be taking. Essentially, in this particular case, we had an owner that remained in violation after being alerted, wasn't there not controlling their animal, it was them not providing the things that the animal needs, the basic minimums of ensuring that there was water all the time, um, ensuring that the animal was only tethered, supervised during a, a temporary task, that sort of thing. We're talking about animals that ended up being tethered for hours and, and days. Um, on end with no reprieve. 
Kern, I don't know if you want to follow up anything. Sure, Kern Rare from the Office of Law, just briefly. So uh, you're correct. So there's limited circumstances where animal care and control can impound an animal. Um, and Robin and I have gone back and forth on this a, new, a number of times. Um, but yeah, generally when it would come to tethering, there are really two that we are looking at. The first is that uh, an animal whose owner fails to respond to a notice that the animal's in violation of the article, which that more applies to public safety threats at large, nuisance, disturbance, where the animal is causing the problem. Here, the animal's not causing the problem. And the only other section they could really fall into is that is for an animal placed at risk by its health or environment. And at that point, when we get to the determination that it's at risk, it's pretty far down the road in becoming dangerous for the animal. So that would apply in the extreme heat, extreme cold, those kind of situations, or where it becomes clear to the animal care and control officer that the situation that the animal is in isn't just an animal that's tethered and is, you know, sitting in its in its area comfortably, but that it's already in some sort of distress and is at risk, and then they can intervene. But that that would result in the officer having to get there pretty late in the process when the animal's already at a rather severe risk when it comes to tethering. Thank you. Are, are there any other questions? Crickets? Okay. Thank you all for coming in this morning. We're going to move on to bill number 7221 is the prevailing wage bill. Mr. Barron. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, Pete Barron with the administration. Uh, joining me at the virtual table, we have our budget officer, Mr. Trumbauer, uh, Mr. Heim, our, our purchasing agent who you just heard from, uh, our DPW director, Mr. Phipps, and uh, Ms. Lori Blair Klausmeyer, our uh, county, deputy county attorney, and her cat. Um, so um, we're really excited to, to bring this bill forward. Uh, I want to thank uh, the, the four council members who joined on as co sponsors. Um, Bill 7221 establishes prevailing wage and local hiring requirements for county capital projects valued over 250000 or which utilize over um, uh, $5 million in, in county funds. Uh, a wage um, is the basic hourly rate of wages and benefits paid to similar workers uh, within the area. The way this bill uh, determines what those wages are is we use the state um, Department of Labor Licensing and Regulation uh, already sets those wages. Um, they set them for our area. So there will be no additional research that is needed to, to set the wages um, in other jurisdictions. Uh, they come up with very complicated uh, processes to assess uh, wages and create um, I think a lot of effort. Uh, we determined that given that um, uh, somebody else already does that quite well, uh, we should use those uh, for our area. Um, in addition to the prevailing wage uh, uh, provisions in the bill, Bill 7221 establishes a local hire provision for new employees on county projects. Contractors uh, must use the best efforts to fill at least 51% of the new jobs required to complete the capital improvement contract or capital project with county residents. To, it's a little bit confusing to make that clear. If I owned a plumbing company and I could complete the county job without having to hire any new workforce, any new workers, any new plumbers, um, I would not have to fire my current employees and replace them with county residents only if I needed to hire, say, 10 more um, uh, positions to complete the contract and I need to hire 10 positions, I would have to make best efforts to make sure 51% of them uh, were county residents. Um, 
with that, happy to answer any questions um, that the council might have, but that's uh, the, the 10,000 foot overview of the bill. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Uh, Ms. Hare, click at their flag, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Jessica Hare, District 7. Um, Mr. Barron, since the state prevailing wage already applies to anything that's funded with at least 50% state dollars, or I believe it's schools that are funded with 25% state dollars, how many projects are we talking about this bill impacting on an annual basis? That's a good question. Um, I know we've we've looked at some of that. I'm going to ask one of the experts to if they know uh, off the top of their head or if we're still calculating those numbers. Mr. Trumbauer, maybe you or Mr. Heim. Uh, Chris Trumbauer, budget officer. I, I think DPW is the best equipped to answer that. Didn't, didn't Mr. Phipps have an estimate on county projects? Yes, this is Chris Phipps, um, Director of Public Works. And I we did run um, an analysis and determined that the value of the, the construction cost value is is estimated at about 320 million, um, you know, in current contracts and in the FY22 budget, and of those, there's 97 that made that's made up of 97 contracts. Now, then deeper dive, we looked at how many of those projected contracts are greater than 250 thousand, and and we estimated 77. So. 77 in the upcoming year are greater than 250,000 each for a total of 320 million. Madam Chair, I have a couple more and I have a follow up, but if other folks have a question, I'm happy Go to sit back. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Phipps, you mentioned 250,000 and I, I believe the state threshold is, is 500,000. I don't see a threshold unless I missed it in here, but I don't see a threshold. Is it the intention of the administration to set a minimum threshold that the prevailing wage would apply only to contracts over 250,000? Or, or are we looking at 500,000 or is there no threshold? And it's, you know, if it's a $5,000 contract, it might apply subject to, I understand that there's one here if it's awarded without competition, but I'm just trying to understand, are we, is it 77 contracts or 97 or something else? Uh, oh. I'll let Lori or someone from the law office correct me, but I thought in subsection A2 115A, it it um, mentioned 250,000 as the threshold. Okay, I may just uh, Yeah. And, and oh. so, uh, Councilwoman, uh, sorry, Pete Barron with the administration. Uh, there was a, a state bill um, that uh, became law uh, the governor vetoed and the General Assembly overrode the veto at the end of last session that lowered the state threshold from 500,000 to 250,000. So we're matching. You're matching the state. Okay. Perfect. That's helpful. Um, on page three of the bill, it is section I guess A6 under definitions, director, and it says means the director of the department that administers and enforces the county prevailing wage requirements or the director's designee, which department are you envisioning would do that enforcement? Is it DPW? Um, that's a great question, Councilwoman, and it, and it was a discussion that we we in, uh, had uh, internally. Uh, Pete Barron with the administration, sorry, getting used to Zoom again. Um, uh, the, the idea was to leave it flexible. Um, we believe it will likely be central services or DPW. Uh, but we wanna, it, this, uh, Mr. Heim noted in his presentation, uh, implementing it, it will, we wanna make sure that we have the, the right people around the table and the right flexibility. It will be um, almost certainly DPW or central services. Okay. I'll back off while Ms. Stewart asks a question and then I have a couple more. Ms. Stewart. Thank you, Madam Chair. Linda Stewart, Legislative Council. First, I want to thank Mr. Barron for uh, taking the time to go over some of the provisions of this uh, bill. And one of the things we talked about was that a particular department is not designated in the bill. And 
I have a question that I didn't think to ask when we got together to talk about this. But if it is central services that is the one who decides whether or not there's been a violation of the bill, um, that would would involve things like not paying the, the prevailing uh, wage. And it says that if the director finds that there's a violation, then an appeal can be made to the purchasing agent. So I, I don't quite understand how that works because you then you would be having the head of a department saying, yep, there's a violation and you appeal it to that very same department to someone, no offense, Mr. Heim, who is lower in status than the director. That So I just have a concern about how that would work if it's central services, because I think in Mr. Heim's presentation, he talked about the purchasing agent and his staff working on prevailing wage issues. So I'm just confused about that, how that would work if it's central services that is designated. Pete Barron with the administration, I'm gonna let Ms. Uh, Anderson speak, but I, I think what uh, you're about to say is there this uh, provision is similar to other provisions in law. So Ms. Anderson. Thank you, Christine Anderson, Director of Central Services. You are correct. We actually have similar provisions. Um, I agree that it might look a little bit odd. However, the relationship between the Director of Central Services and the purchasing agent is actually laid out in the charter where the purchasing agent has authority that I do not have. Uh, so he, I could say, Andrew, do that contract. And he could look at me and say, respectfully, no. Um, We've never had that situation. We never will because we work very well together and he follows the, lo the law and the code. And we know if there was a resets issue, we would be discussing it with the Office of Law and Administration and we would, there are other avenues to go. So having said all of that, um, the current, the structure that is in this bill mirrors the structure we have for other complaint driven policies related to the purchasing code. Um, and so I don't think it's an anomaly at all. Mr. Volke. Thank you, Nathan Volke, District 3. Um, I'm looking at the fiscal note on this bill and trying to understand what the impact will be financially to the county with respect to contracts um, if this bill were to pass. And I see that the first sentence of the fiscal impact is the fiscal impact on local revenue is indeterminate. And then it keeps going on about the reasons why. Um, so I guess I'm gonna try to back into that number then in a different way. Can someone tell me what the current prevailing wage is or how much higher the current prevailing wage is now than the average labor rate that we're paying on county projects? If you can't tell me that right now, can we work to get that information? Because I would appreciate it because I'm trying to understand what the difference is going to be. Clearly, uh, as the fiscal note says, the intention of this bill is to increase, uh, it says under prevailing wage by boosting the income of low wage workers with jobs, a higher wage would lift some families' incomes. So clearly this is going to make projects more expensive, but I just wanna understand how much more expensive. And Ms. Pickard has told me we have a wage sheet in the document, so I'll look at that too in addition to the question I ask, thank you. Uh, Councilman Volke, Pete Barron with the administration. Um, uh, the, the wages are set by trade category. So it's it's not as simple as uh, a laborer makes, you know, $15 an hour. It's, you know, divided up by plumber, pipe fitter, elevator operator or elevator uh, uh, construction. Mm -hmm. All of those wages are set forth in, in state law. Um, Councilman Volke, you're, you, if you look uh, at the state bill that passed in, in, previous, in the previous um, legislative session, their fiscal and policy note also struggled with that very question. Um, the, the academic research on the cost of uh, prevailing wage is, is quite mixed. Um, there was an effort led, and I, I blanking on the state, I want to say it was Ohio, um, but don't quote me on that, I will find it for you, where the um, legislature in their infinite wisdom repealed uh, a prevailing wage law, stating that it would dramatically save the taxpayers money, and 
lo and behold, they did not see a drop in uh, their construction contracts. Um, what you have is not just the wages that you are paying to the employee, but the the um, the competitive nature of our procurement process, the uh, cost of uh, construction. If you know, I have a master electrician doing the work. Uh, they might be more efficient and take less time than a uh, person who is not uh, as experienced. So um, the academic research is is quite mixed, um, and I think the fiscal note got it right that the the only costs that we can accurately um, predict are are the costs for the additional personnel uh, that would be needed to implement this. Everything else um, is um, e nationally the research is indeterminate uh, about what the actual cost is. So happy to have a further discussion with you, Councilman. Happy to provide you uh, the fiscal note from that bill and some other resources. Uh, there was actually a, a study done um, uh, by uh, a Pinnacle Economics that I think it's Pinnacle, and you should have that dot, that study that looked at the economic impact in Anne Arundel County of a uh, potential prevailing wage program, and it found some significant benefits. Um, and then there's the the key question I think, it, which is you know. We are um, the stewards of, of our, our taxpayers' dollars, and we should also be good employers. We should not be paying people uh, sub-living uh, wages. So with that, um, I think uh, happy to continue to provide additional information, but hopefully that helps. Ms. Fiedler. Thank you, Madam Chair, Amanda Fiedler, District 5. I have a question um, on page 7, line 31, uh, local hiring, a contractor shall make best efforts. Can someone describe what those best efforts look like when you're reviewing? Sorry, uh, Pete Barron uh, was struggling to find my uh, mute button. Um, so, and I'll, I'll ask our, our purchasing agent as well if, if he has thoughts, but the, the idea is that the, the contractor would have to attest that they, um, they made a legitimate good faith effort to, to find a um, local person. That would mean uh, advertising in local papers, that would maybe mean contacting workforce development, that might mean contacting the community college. Um, you can't, you know, put up one flyer outside a giant and say I've made best efforts. So, um, Mr. Heim, maybe you can expand on that a little bit. Absolutely. Thank you, Pete. Uh, Andrew Heim, uh, purchasing agent for Anne Arundel County. Uh, let me just jump in here and just say that uh, as part of the project plan that we've been putting together for prevailing wage and seeing how it's going to be structured and administered and, and records and audit and everything else that would go along with it, uh, one of the things that we've been thinking about with this of looking at that local hire requirement and seeing how could we create a standardized reporting process for contractors that are subject to this to be able to evaluate and see how the performance is going and then bring in other key stakeholders, not just myself, so that ultimately it's not just a, you know, there's transparency and that there's checks and balances created behind that process to look at it and say, how are they doing? And what is the standard in which we're evaluating to see, is that really truly a best effort? And then a way in which we could, uh, if we are challenging that best effort attempt, how are we going to address that and manage it? Because ultimately it should be fair, transparent and clear cut. It can't be something where we are being arbit arbitrary in a, well, in this case, we allowed this company to jump through and they're okay. But in this case, somebody else did the exact same thing and we're not, we're gonna go after them for that. So it's, it's creating a program and a policy around that. Ms. Hare. Thank you, Madam Chair, Jessica Hare, District 7. Um, Mr. Barron, I wanna talk for a few minutes about sort of the violations and the recourse. And there's two, pieces uh, that I have concerns with. 
The first is this private cause of action that's essentially created. Um, and the second is the joint and several liability for a subcontractor's noncompliance. Um, and I know both of those provisions exist in the state. They're recent additions to the state law. I want to say somewhere around 2019, they were they were added in. Um, but if the director and then on appeal, the purchasing agent can withhold funds from a subcontractor and pay each employee the full amount of wages due under the section, why is it then we are simultaneously creating a private right of action in the court system? It seems to me you could almost end up fighting two battles for double the money if you've got both a lawsuit by an employee directly against a contractor and also withholding of funds by the county. And in fact, you could have a lawsuit by a subcontractor's employee that you don't even, you're not even aware they're not being paid the appropriate prevailing wage. You could be both sued by them directly and also have money withheld by the county. It seems like it should be either or. And if the county is going to take responsibility for investigating and determining violations, it doesn't seem to me that a private right of action um, makes any sense. It seems like it could cause a whole lot of confusion. Um, I've seen this play out at the state level a little bit, and it seems like that's exactly what it does. So I'm curious if you have any thoughts on that. Um, Pete Barron with the administration. Um, we, we did look at, at making sure that there was a robust um, enforcement mechanisms and down to who's the best um, person to know uh, that a violation has happened. So that's why we felt that uh, a, a, the county having a role as well as um, the individual who's been wronged. Um, I, I could be wrong, but I don't believe uh, a court would award damages if they've already been paid out by the county. So um, I think uh, we're comfortable with um, matching the state law here. But do you see my question in terms of the, you're still then battling on two fronts, maybe a court doesn't award it eventually, but you're subjecting a contractor to multiple battles for potentially a violation they didn't know was occurring and they could go on simultaneously. Could we have Ms. Klausmeyer uh, speak to this a bit? Sure. Hi, Lori Blair Klausmeyer, Deputy County Attorney. I'm I'm reading through here. I'm sorry, I'm missing the private cause of action. Can you what the site it, it, is? It is on page four. It is e-contract requirements um, part two. The contract requirements, a capital improvement contract shall specify that an aggrieved employee or apprentice as a third party beneficiary may by a civil action against the contractor recover the difference between prevailing wage for the type of work performed and the amount actually received with interest and reasonable attorney's fees. Okay, because I was looking under the violation, yeah, under the violation section and the relief there that's talking purely about the county's um, recourse. I think, and what this is saying is that this is a really a notification to the employee. And I think that this would be true. We aren't really creating this cause of action. I mean, I think if, if an employee is not paid what the employee is entitled to under law, the employee would have this cause of action, whether we say so or not. Um, so we aren't creating this. And I think Mr. Barron is correct. The court is gonna look at what, if that employee got paid, there is not going to be a private cause of action. Um, if the county, took action under the violations subsection. Um, so they're not gonna get it twice. And this is actually part of the contract. So the contractor is going to know about it. The contractor is gonna know <clears throat> that they're exposed kind of on two fronts, so to speak. Um, so I, I don't really have an issue with that. This is just a, a cause of action that would arise if you're not paid what you're supposed to be paid. <clears throat> but so let, let me play this out, I suppose. Um, I work for a company, they don't pay me the prevailing wage. I complain to the director um, and the director does an investigation and the director says, okay, yes, you're entitled to this money. The contractor didn't pay you the correct amount of funding. We're gonna withhold that money from the contractor and we're going to pay you directly the amount of money you were missing, which is all in, allowed under this bill. That yes. makes sense to me. But 
under under this, not only that, I could work for a subcontractor, make the same claim. So even if the contractor is paying all of their employees correctly, I could be working for a subcontractor and the the general contractor is now joint and severally liable for the subcontractor's failures. And not only that, I can simultaneously file a lawsuit in court and get my attorney's fees and everything else while I'm also complaining to the county about it and having the county try and fix it. Doesn't it seem like if you're going to allow a lawsuit, maybe it should be after you've had a determination by the county or the county hasn't been able to help you or it just, this to me seems like. Right, but what I'm saying, what I'm saying is that what you're talking about is a provision in the contract saying that the contractor has to comply and has to understand in the, that an employee can do that. Whether, so, so and I think what I'm saying is I don't think we are creating this cause of action. I think an employee could do that, whether we say it in the contract or not, this is just kind of a notif- almost a notification. So when it gets to court, I mean, if, if an employee chooses to do that, then that's something where the court is going to decide whether that employee still remains aggrieved, whether the contractor and the subcontractor are liable. I, I, but the point is we aren't really creating that cause of action other than the fact that we are imposing a, an obligation to pay a prevailing wage. So my guess is if you get through the county system, I mean, it'd be a lot easier to go through the, the county than it is to, to file a lawsuit, but I don't think they would be, if we didn't have that language in there, I don't think an employee would be precluded from filing a lawsuit. I think that's what I'm. So I can, I can at least say that at the state level and any kind of federal lawsuit up until 2019, when this provision was added to the state law, you went through the department of labor and that's how it worked. You made a complaint to the department of labor. The department of labor would investigate. The department of labor would withhold funding. You did not have a private cause of action against an employer for violations of the wage rates because it's a third party beneficiary situation. It's not a direct contractual requirement between you and the employer. So this does create a a private cause of action for these county projects that didn't exist before. And like I said, I know the state did it in 2019 um, for state work. So for anything that's already under the state prevailing wage, this does already apply, but, but there, it definitely opens up additional, uh, you know, lawsuits. And I'm just, I'm looking at it from an inefficiency standpoint. To me, this is uh, judicially inefficient if we're giving the recourse through the county and the county has the ability to withhold funds i for me i just don't see that this makes any sense and i certainly don't see that it makes sense to hold a contractor joint and severally liable for the failures of their subcontractor um that is something that you know separately can be withheld from funds from the subcontractor that's so that's my concern with it um but i can leave that piece of that for now i think my question's been answered I'd like to jump in, uh, Sarah Lacey, District 1, for, on two aspects that of what um, Ms. Hare, what you were bringing up. First, about the subcontractor. I read paragraph F on the same page, beginning at line 34, as to prohibit uh, there being any subcontracts, um, so that the same contractor who is covered by the contract requirements that we were just discussing wouldn't be able to have a subcontract that could then violate um, any of the requirements of this section, or they would face other violations for doing so. Um, but that, apart from that, um, whether or not paragraph E2 creates a new cause of action, I think another way of looking at it is to put the contractor on notice that the aggrieved employee or apprentice not only could bring this civil action, um, which I think is consistent with other, other areas of law that are aimed at, say, consumer protection, uh, labor protection. It's just, you know, we're just talking about reform. So um, reform could go one way or another way. But that, more importantly, in this paragraph, I think you can't have your contractor saying something like, an employee has to give up their right to go to court and to find a remedy in the judicial system um, by compelling the employee to go to arbitration or mediation or some other uh, remedy before they go to court. Um, And then that's kind of what this notice says to me, but I'm happy to hear advice from the administration and Ms. Plassmeyer on that, but 
Uh, I think we have different readings here going on. Um, Pete Barron with the administration. Um, I, maybe one uh, uh, way to think about it, and maybe Mr. Phipps can can speak to this a little bit. It, if uh, if we have a contract, um, I don't know, to build uh, a wall, and that wall has a subcontractor who's going to provide the bricks. Um, if if the subcontractor fails to provide the bricks and the wall doesn't get built, we do still hold the contractor to account. Correct, Mr. Phipps? Yes, Chris Phipps, Director of Public Works, because our contractual relationship is with the general contractor. We don't have a direct contractual relationship with the subcontractor, so we would still hold the GC liable. Ms. Hare? Thank you, Madam Chair, Jessica Hare, District 7. The difference there being that the general contractor has oversight of getting bricks to the site, right? Like the, the general contractor doesn't have, uh, you know, access to specific accounting, et cetera, of, of, of every single sub and flow down. I have provisions flowing down to subcontractors, but you've essentially imposed almost impossible standards on a general contractor for oversight of accounting procedures and payment procedures and telling them that they can't rely on affidavits or certified payrolls submitted by their subcontractors if you then hold them jointly or separately liable jointly and separately liable for the for violations of their sub. Um, again, flow down saying hey, you have to put in your subcontract that they have to pay the prevailing wage. No problem with flow down provisions. It's it's the liability on the back end and how many tiers down does it go? I mean, you could, you the GC might have no idea, you know, who's delivering bricks and putting them here and what they're getting paid. They've said, and they've put it in their contract, you have to pay them this. But if that subcontractor then does something underhanded and doesn't pay them, um, it's a slippery slope for who, who we're holding accountable. Um, that's all. Does anyone else have a comment or a question on Bill 7221? Hearing none, okay, thank you all for your time this morning. We're gonna go on to Bill 7321. The approval of a lease agreement for the Copper Mine Tennis Facility. Mr. Barron. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, Pete Barron with the administration uh, sticking uh, with us um, for, for this bill is Mr. Trumbauer, our budget officer. Uh, joining us is Ms. Matthews from Rec and Parks. Uh, Mr. Heim is still sticking with us. Um, uh, from central services and from law, Ms. Niederer. Um, 7321 approves a lease agreement between the county and Copper Mine for county owned property uh, located at 1580 Millersville Road, Millersville. The property will be developed into a tennis facility for community use. The initial term of the lease is 25 years and does require county approval. Um, I want to uh, thank uh, Councilman Pruski. Um, I don't know, he might have had to uh, jump off for, for a, a work engagement, but uh, we've been in um, long conversations with him. We are currently working on language for an amendment uh, to clarify that the scope of the tennis facility is limited to what is currently planned and that any future changes uh, would require future council actions. Um, with that, we're, we're happy to uh, answer any questions um, and we're excited to, to bring this project forward. Does anyone have any questions? Mr. Volke. Thank you, Madam Chair, Nathan Volke, District 3. Um, I just wanna verify that I'm reading correctly. So in the fiscal note, it talks about the amount of rent payments that the county will receive and over the life of the lease, it looks like the total amount of rent 
for 25 years if all of the options are renewed by Copper Mine Tennis Facility would be 2.6 million. Am I reading that correctly? Chris Tremmer, budget officer, uh, that's the information that, that we got from, from the lease. Okay, and if I can just follow up, Madam Chair. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Trumbauer, I, as I recall it from the budget, we're spending approximately $8 million on this capital project to build this uh, facility. Is that right? Um, Chris Trumbauer, budget officer. Uh, Mr. Councilman Volke, so the project total at the moment, uh, as of the uh, FY22 budget, is about $7.3 million of prior approved. So there hasn't been any new money added in 22, but that, that is the total that has been approved uh, to date. And as, as um, well, C Council Member Pruski would know because he, he was on this body, but uh, some, of, some of you may not have the history, but this project was first put into the budget, uh, I believe in the FY2, in the FY16 budget, um, for planning and, and uh, feasibility. And that was ultimately for athletic fields. And then the, the following year, I believe in FY17, uh, the current county executive at the time put forth the idea of a competitive tennis center. And then this administration has uh, changed that scope to be, uh, like Mr. Barron said, more of a community focused um, indoor outdoor uh, tennis facility. But there is still prior approved funding in the budget and that remains available to build the outside portion of the amenities that are planned on site. Ms. Hare. Thank you, Madam Chair. Jessica Hare, District 7. I have um, a little bit of, a, I guess, a blue sky question. I've received a few emails from folks and I thought this was an interesting idea. Um, I've seen in other places or have read a couple of articles where they've done some cool redevelopment projects for things um, like sports facilities or tennis centers and things like that. And um, we have some properties around the county that might be appropriate, maybe, maybe not, but might be appropriate for redevelopment efforts. And I'm wondering if any thought um, had been put into taking this project and making it a redevelopment project for an area that might otherwise be underutilized, whether it's vacant mall space or, or something else like that. Um, and I know that again, we're they're already here with the site development and, and the lease, et cetera, to take a look at. But just since this issue's been raised, I think it's important to know what other options were considered in this process. Uh, I, I can handle that one, Mr. Barron, if you'd like. Uh, Chris Tremmer. To... I figured. Uh, Chris Tremmer, budget officer. Um, and first, let me say, uh, Councilwoman Hare, you, you may want to follow up directly with the department. Um, either with Erica or with Director Lays, because uh, I know that they were involved in this. But um, under uh, uh, Director Anthony's um, tenure, uh, which was just uh, probably a couple of years ago, there was a study. The county executive, uh, Mr. Pittman, directed the department to look at that very question because he had the exact same thought. So you can take some solace yeah. that you guys had a mind melt there. Um, and the department did a study, and um, I will do the Cliff Notes version. They found it prohibitively expensive to do that um, for a variety of reasons. And I suspect if you were to follow up with uh, Ms. Lays, she could provide you the report. Um, but we did want to pursue that direction. And um, ultimately the conclusion was that that, that was not a, um, uh, a cost efficient way to, um, to look at this particular uh, project, but I, I do believe that this administration wants to continue looking at that for future facilities when when it does make sense. And I, and I will defer to, to Ms. Um, Matthews Jackson in case there's anything that she wants to add. She may be more familiar with the, that work. Good afternoon. The department is looking at other sites for the purpose of redevelopment. We actually do have a study as part of our fiscal 22 budget, and that is now underway. So. The idea of redevelopment and using other areas is one that we do take, um, that we, we are taking seriously and looking into. In terms of Millersville, um, this has been the selected site for a couple of reasons. Um, it's centrally located. The most growth in the county is in North and West County, which is where this is located. It has great access. 
Um, we've submitted applications to program open space, and this site has always been intended to be an active recreational site. This plan today and the information that's being presented is consistent with our applications to program open space, as well as the scope that the county council has already approved. That is all very helpful information. I appreciate it. Um, Ms. Matthews, if you do have a copy of that report that Mr. Trumbauer referenced, um, I would love to see it at your convenience, but I, I appreciate all the information. Okay, Ms. Fiedler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Amanda Fiedler, District 5. So just looking at the, um, the very long document, 254 pages, it looks like there are 16 outdoor courts and eight indoor courts planned. Is that accurate? And is there anything else proposed non-tennis related for this project? Uh, I'm going to defer so I don't get the number of courts incorrect to either Mr. Trumbauer or Ms. Matthews. Uh, I can take this question. The full scope of the project as approved by County Council provides 16 outdoor tennis courts a clubhouse, an indoor tennis facility with eight courts. Uh, there is a paved loop trail for walking, uh, parking, and then there's some site work, landscaping, and stormwater management and related amenities. Uh, Thank may, you, May I follow up one thing on that, uh, Madam Chair? Um, Go ahead. Chris from our budget officer. Um, so what, what Ms. Um, Matthews was referencing is, is the master plan, and she's absolutely correct. However, one asterisk to that is um, there's only at, there's only eight outdoor courts that are funded. Um, so um, the, the current amount of funding in the project and, and the county executive and the administration have made, have made very clear that, that the current scope of the project only includes eight outdoor courts. So that, that was very important to Council Member Prusky and his um, uh, workings with the, the local community. Um, so that that is a current limitation on the scope of the project. But Ms. Matthews is absolutely correct. The, the master plan for that site uh, does have 16 courts, but those additional eight outdoor courts will never get built um, without the funding and, and further approval from the council. Mr. Volke. Thank you, Madam Chair. Nathan Volke, District 3. Um, so I, while I'm sitting here, pulled up I appreciate the history of Mr. Trumbauer on this project and who put it in and how it was started. Um, as I recall, there was a group known as the Tennis Alliance who was involved with this project early on. And part of the reason that they needed county funding was because they intended to raise money. They were going to operate this program. It was going to be a big boon for the county. We were going to make a lot of money off of it. The fiscal um, situation looked very bright. And people said, we're, we're going to really... Uh, recoup all of our investment. Um, at this point, it doesn't sound like we're going to recoup the 7.3 million that we are putting out because now we funded the entirety of the project. Whereas originally the county was just supposed to kick the money out at first and the Tennis Alliance was gonna come back and fundraise and then backfill that money. Um, it was sort of like the idea that if the county committed to the funding, then all of a sudden they were gonna be able to raise a lot of money. I remember that whole discussion. Um, that was why they were looking at how much the Tennis Alliance was gonna put in vis-a-vis -vis the county. So now we're in a position where this council has previously appropriated $7.3 million on this project, but the money, as I understand it, hasn't been spent. So if similar to what we do in other projects, it would be appropriated, it could certainly be spent on other projects because again, it hasn't been spent. We're looking at a lease that over the term of 25 years, um, probably with the inflation that we're about to see based on policies this administration at the federal level has put in place uh, is going to diminish the value of money significantly. I went backward and looked at an inflation calculator going back 25 years to 1996 and the value of $2.6 million um, at, at that time is about half, uh, maybe a third of what it would be. So I guess in looking at all this, I'm just trying to understand What's the bang for our buck that the county is getting out of this? We're putting out 7.3 million. This project was initially pitched as one thing when the money was put in. Now the whole project has changed. Now we've got an operator coming in and we're making a whopping $2.6 million over 25 years. And I just don't, I don't see how the taxpayers are getting a major benefit other than we're getting some more tennis courts. 
May I, may I Madam Chair? Uh, Chris, Chris from our budget officer. Uh, so Councilman Volke, I appreciate the question. I, I think you have a, a rather large misunderstanding of the project. Um, so the funding that's in the county budget at the moment is for the outside portion of the site. So this is obviously the tennis courts, um, but there's also stormwater management, there's parking, there's roads. Uh, I've been to the site, there's literally nothing on it except meadow, a couple of old barns and an abandoned house. So there's zero infrastructure. So there's gonna need to be environmental work done there. There's gonna be a uh, build out of the site. The, the indoor facility, the tennis uh, center as it, as it is, that's being constructed entirely by the private entity. Um, so, so the county is not building that. That's the whole part, that's the whole uh, rationale behind this third party agreement. And what's changed, and you're absolutely right, it's changed uh, from the original um, conception is it's no longer the Tennis Alliance, but this is the third party, uh, this entity Copper Mine, uh, which has my understanding is a, a very good track record um, across the region of, of building similar facilities. So they're coming in and this, this lease is allowing them to build this facility. Um, we're, not, we're not paying for that, they are. Um, so what our county dollars are going to is all the other things that are happening on the site, like I mentioned, parking, stormwater management, the outdoor tennis courts, um, and things like that. So does that clear it up a little bit for you? Uh, Madam Chair. Go ahead. Thank you. It, it does a little bit, Mr. Trumbauer, I guess then my follow-up question would be, if Coppermine is building the indoor facility, we're spending 7.3 million on the site development, the, the outdoor tennis courts, all that, they're building the indoor facility. So we're still, only making $2.6 million over 25 years? Or is there more to come? Is there another piece of this lease that we're gonna see at another point? Are, uh, Chris from our budget officer, are, are you asking if there's more cash coming to the county? Correct. Uh, not, to, not to my knowledge, but again, this is, a, this is essentially providing a county amenity uh, and, and a, we're having a cost share arrangement with with copper mine. So if the county itself was to build an indoor recreation center, that would cost millions, if not tens of millions of more more dollars than than what is before you now. And so from the county's perspective, we're getting a need for a uh, indoor outdoor you know tennis facility, which um, my understanding from the department is, consistently near the top of, of their LPPRP um, surveys. And so we are, we are getting this for much less cost to county taxpayers and much less county general obligation bonds because, num because A, a significant portion of this funding was through state program open space money, but B, the indoor facility is being done in this um, public private partnership, if you will, with, with copper mine. So I, I guess, I guess I'm not, I'm not understanding the premise of your question. If if we're getting more cash, what we're getting is a tennis center. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll follow up with you, Mr. Trumbauer, by email. I don't want to spend everybody else's time, but I appreciate the answer to the questions. They did clear a few of my concerns up, so thank you. Sure thing. Ms. Pinker. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, everybody. I have, a, I have a question. I have actually two questions, if I may. Um, one, what what is the total acreage of this site? And will after the the current project is um, created and built, will there be more? Is there still more space in the in the property? And then two, I'd like to know how many um, how much cash to the county is created by parks such as Val Branch, Ticknack, um, for uh, the county taxpayer. I don't think our county parks are meant to be revenue generators. Um, they're meant to be quality of life enhancers. And um, we fall short of active rec in this county as we do our neighboring jurisdictions. Do you want me to answer the question about the development of the site? Yes, ma'am. Good morning. Um, so the site is roughly 33 acres. There is some area that is left that's sort of this open grassy field that's sort of located between the trails and the back of the development. 
we are trying to limit the amount of trees that we're taking down. So we are trying to work within the footprint that um, that's kind of already cleared and that the farmer was previously using. So we have, I think, 12 or 13 acres that's undeveloped, but a majority of that is fully wooded, and I can get you those exact numbers. That answer is sufficient. That's fine. Thank you. Ms. Picker, are you uh, wanting your other question answered now? It was a bit sarcastic and rhetoric. Well, Thanks. so Ma Madam Chair, I, I, can, I can give a broad question as far as uh, or a broad answer as far as Rec and Parks um, Go ahead. Uh, revenue. Um, so Rec, Rec and Parks uh, revenue in FY22 estimate is $6.7 million. But of course, that's inclusive of a lot of things. If if you wanted a more specific down, we, we could take a little time and get you that, uh, Council Member Picker. Madam Chair. Go ahead. So Mr. Trumbauer, with that said, how much annually do we spend operationally and with our capital budget on rec and parks in Anne Arundel County? The, the, you want the total rec and parks uh, FY22? Can you I ballpark it? I don't have that off the top of my head, but Ms. Matthews may know it. She's more intimately familiar with all of her projects than I am. Well, again, I'm just being fun. Okay. I can give you the top level summary from the class uh, in the budget book. Um, so the total for the P class this year is roughly 47.1 million, I think is what it is off yep. the top of my head. 47.4, you're pretty good, Erica. Close. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, Ms. Matthews, thank you very much. And it seems like this public private partnership is going to be a boon to the county. So thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else have a question or a comment on Bill 7321? Okay, sounds like crickets again. Thank you all uh, for your time this morning. We're gonna move on to bill number 7421, which is Ms. Hare's bill on subdivision development, site development. And when we have the whole panel here, then I'll turn it over to you, Ms. Hare. Thank you, Madam Chair. Jessica Hare, District 7. Um, this is a pretty simple bill. Actually, some of this uh, comes out of Bill 8620 that was not successful at the council, and some of it comes from conversations with um, farmers in the county who are having some difficulty trying to do direct sales to uh, the community. And I, I think particularly after COVID and, and all of this, I have seen a huge demand from my constituents for this ability to purchase directly from farmers. Um, I, I think other folks in the county feel the same in other districts, um, but I know that right now uh, there's a long process. If a farmer just wants to be able to put up a produce stand on their property, they actually have to submit a full site development plan. It's a, it's a long process. They're getting a little bit bogged down in the weeds. It can be expensive and time consuming, and they often either give up um, or just get exasperated, et cetera. Um, so in working with both economic development and um, the Ag Commission and also planning and zoning, thank you all for the many meetings. Thank you for admin coordinating in those meetings as well. We have come up with a couple of times where we could have exemptions from this full site development plan so that if a farm wants to put up you know, a produce stand or a farm stand, they can do so with some streamlined procedures. Um, and there are limits to it. Um, there's a cumulative limit of 1,200 square feet of floor area um, or 5,000 square feet of disturbance. And that, uh, to my recollection from the conversations with planning and zoning, is when stormwater um, requirements kick in, which is why those limits were set. Um, you know, an ag building that already doesn't require a permit under other areas of the construction code would be able to be put up without a full site development plan, um, things like that. So we've created these exceptions. Um, I think it will help farmers. I think you will see more of that direct consumer sale. We talked in the general development plan and earlier in this year and earlier in the term about trying to make sure our farms can stay farming and keep them sustainable. I think this is one tool that would help them do that. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions, but I hope you all will support. 
Mr. Barron. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank uh, uh, the sponsor as well. As um, Councilman Hare mentioned, there's been a, a lot of discussion on this bill. Um, uh, real briefly, I have our OPC director, uh, Mr. Kai Ziegler, um, and uh, Kelly Kenny from the Office of Law. We also have our deputy CAO for land use, Ms. Lori Rhodes, all of whom have been in involved in, in conversations around this issue. Um, as, as Councilman Hare noted, the, um, the Bill 8620, um, just for a little bit of history, kind of started um, trying to tackle this issue um, and uh, ballooned to tackle a couple of other issues. And um, I guess it stopped uh, by trying to do a little bit too much in that bill. And um, we're glad that uh, Councilman Hare is, is bringing back this portion of that bill. Um, I will, um, and, and apologies, I, I gave Councilman Hare uh, a heads up of maybe a half an hour uh, that I was gonna do this, um, but the administration supports the bill, obviously, but we would also, we are also working on developing uh, what we hope will be a friendly amendment uh, that would specifically exempt farms uh, from necessitating a zoning certificate of use. Um, we have some uh, issues to, to work out on that, and um, uh, this bill won't be heard until October, so we do have a little bit of time, uh, but I do want to flag that um, uh, Lori Rhodes and um, OPC and, and the administration want to uh, make sure that we are, are allowing the code to uh, help our, our farmers and move some unnecessary burdens um, to flag the issue. And I'm probably not doing it justice, Ms. Rhodes. If I, if I mangled it, feel free to jump in. But the, um, the intent would be uh, of our amendment to codify a current practice and make the code match the current practice, not create any new benefit, but just an opportunity for a little additional cleanup uh, while we have this vehicle. Uh, again, uh, a little early to, to put you on the spot, Councilman Hare, to ask for that to be treated as friendly, but flagging that uh, we will be bringing that, uh, or at least working to attempt to bring it forward in the coming weeks. So with that, um, administration supports this bill. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Ms. Pickard, your hand is raised, but I don't think you mean for it to be raised. Okay. Um, anyone else? Uh, okay. I think no one has any questions at this time. Thank you all for coming. We will move on to bill number 7521 and look forward to discussing uh, 7421 in the future. Okay. 7521 is about community meetings. It is Ms. Fiedler's bill. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Amanda Fiedler, District 5. So this bill came about from um, several constituents reaching out. A majority of them were homeowners that were attempting to replace an existing deck. Um, there were a, a small handful of others that had some kind of replacement of a indoor pool surround. And they expressed frustration um, that the county requires them to hold a community meeting. Um, one individual didn't realize that that was a necessity until um, the, the 11th hour and had to kind of hold moving forward with the replacement in order to schedule a community meeting. And then after delaying the project and increasing cost, no one attended the community meeting, which um, tends to be the trend that I'm hearing from those who are reaching out because it is an in-kind replacement of something that already existed um, as an accessory to the house. So this would just remove the requirement for those community meetings for in-kind replacements. Mr. Barron. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, joining me, swapping out for um, our OPC director, we have Ms. Krenitz. Uh, the rest of the gang is sticking around. Uh, the administration supports uh, this bill. I um, want to thank the sponsor for working with us to develop it. 
Um, it's common sense. We're good with it. Okay, I don't expect anybody to speak up, but this is your chance. And I'm sorry if you're hearing my dog throwing up in the background. Okay, uh, well, thank you everyone. I think we'll move on to bill number 7621. Real property taxes, credits for business entities affected by the state of emergency. Mr. Volpe, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so if you've had an opportunity to look at this bill, if you look in the whereas clause, you can see that the General Assembly passed Senate Bill 887 in the last session of the General Assembly. That bill is now operative. It has taken effect as a law. It authorizes county governments to grant a property tax credit for real or personal property owned or leased by a business entity affected by a specified declared state of emergency. Um, this bill does in fact take that enabling legislation that was passed at the state level and now enacts it in the county code to provide uh, some real tax relief and some real help to businesses affected by the COVID related shutdowns in our county. Um, I would note, I just got a press release while we've been sitting here on the call that I think the county executive has decided to put $500,000 toward a grant program um, to help businesses. This will be a significantly bigger um, spend in terms of county money than any that I have seen that the administration has brought forward um, to help businesses. So my hope is that we can all work together to support this because as so many of these restrictions in the county um, obviously crippled our businesses and hurt them markedly during the pandemic. Um, I would like to see us be able to give them a credit on their property taxes uh, to the extent that they have been impacted. Thank you. Mr. Barron. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Pete Barron with the administration. Uh, Mr. Trumbauer, it, our budget officer, is joining us. Ms. McQuaid is also here, our finance officer, and uh, Ms. Kelly Kenny from the Office of Law. Um, Councilman Volke is correct. The administration has been looking at uh, a number of ways to provide direct targeted assistance to our, our local businesses. Um, I won't, won't list out all the programs that have been uh, provided, but uh, the, the program that was announced today uh, is just an, another one in a long line. I'm sure Mr. Trumbauer has them all memorized. Um, what uh, I, I would say about this bill and where, where the administration sits on this is uh, we agree that we want to help businesses. We also want to make sure that that uh, assistance is targeted uh, to our local businesses and is helping those that need the help. The, the issue that the administration had with the state bill, as we do with this bill, is this is targeted to um, property owners. Many of our businesses don't own their um, property. Many of them rent. Uh, they would not necessarily see a benefit from this bill. Uh, we would see a lot of assistance go to landlords. Um, and additionally, the way, unlike other counties, and this was a statewide bill, uh, unlike other counties in, in the state of Maryland, uh, Anne Arundel County has a property tax revenue cap, which would mean unless we um, sig significantly reduce the, the funds that would go to our teachers, police, and firefighters, and other county services, uh, the, the bill for this um, program would be picked up by the employees and the residents of Anne Arundel County. Um, and then finally, uh, the concern, uh, it, it concern exists around the administration of such a program and the burden it would put on finance. Um, happy to work with, with the sponsor if uh, he would like to, to try to address some of those concerns, but um, we were not involved in the development of this bill. Are there any questions from the council? Ms. Pickard. Yeah, in looking at the, the page three, section E, looking at the duration, um, 
how did the I just wanted the sponsor to to talk more about how he came to the five additional years. Um, you know, businesses are, are, are back open now. So is that just, I just wanted to understand the rationale between the duration, thank you. Mr. Volpe. Thank you, Madam Chair, Nathan Volpe, District 3. Certainly happy to answer that question. So when we were looking at this bill, there are certain businesses who have lost so much revenue that this will allow them to apply that to future years, similar to what we do in other places in the both federal tax code. Uh, I don't know of any in the local tax code, but I know in the federal and the state tax code, you can carry over um, for future years. And so that's the idea here, that to the extent that they have seen their revenue reduced significantly, uh, they can carry over those reductions on an ongoing basis for up to five years. Ms. Hare. Thank you, Madam Chair. Jessica Hare, District 7. Um, as you know, Mr. Volke, I had been working on a bill similar to this that I shared with you. And in the bill that I was considering, um, I was looking at a, a threshold of income reduction between 2019 and 2020 to help kind of get to that issue of let's focus the attention on the businesses that were hardest hit, um, recognizing that obviously there is a, a fiscal impact with all of this. Um, I'm just sort of throwing this out here now, but I'm obviously that's not how you chose to go about it, but I'm curious if you are amenable to that and if the administration has any thoughts about that approach to try and get to a place where everyone's comfortable. Mr. Volke. Thank you, Madam Chair, Nathan Volke, District 3. Certainly happy to have that conversation. Um, what I would say is I, I was aware of the threshold I think it was something like a 50% threshold. I didn't feel like that did enough to help the affected businesses. I think there are many, many people who have been absolutely crushed by what has happened with respect to the COVID related closures across our county. Um, and as a result of that, it seemed appropriate to provide the maximum amount of tax relief that we could. Mr. Barron. Um, I think, uh, Pete Barron with the administration in, in the opening comments, uh, I spoke to the fact that this administration has looked to targeting assistance um, with, with absolutely welcome a conversation that would expand this from the landlord class to all our small businesses. Um, so. Um, Ms. Pickard, do you have another question? Yes, ma'am. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, so in, in looking at targeting um, relief to our hard hit um, business community, I was, I'm wondering if there was any thought about um, those businesses that, you know, looking specifically to those businesses, obviously that own their property, this is the property tax. But with that, um, being a little taking more of a scalpel to it, as you like to say, uh, and looking at folks that fell through the cracks of other federal, state, and AEDC grants or something, just to make this, you know, there's been a lot of relief dollars flowing to the business community from different angles, although there are certain types of businesses that maybe were not eligible for a variety of reasons. I'm just curious if that was... You know, the other thought is we're working on all this relief and this would come, you know, months from now with a tax bill. Um, and those are, those are my, those are my initial thoughts. Mr. Volke. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll try to respond to a couple of the points in there. Um, Ms. Pickard, more than happy to work with you if you want to expand the scope of the tax relief in this bill. I, I would be happy to do that if that looks like uh, expanding this to personal property, if it looks to expanding to additional businesses. Um, but I do think that it's necessary that we open this up pretty broadly because I think that there are many, many, many businesses who have been impacted um, and who have not gotten help. I would also comment on the idea that this is only for landlords. So if you take a look on page two in section B, where it talks about the creation of the tax credit, it does note 
there's a tax credit from county real property taxes imposed on property that is owned or leased by a business entity. Um, so we did attempt in the drafting of this to get at property that was not just owned, but also property that was leased for businesses um, who were then paying the property taxes to the landlord. So that was the concept there to try to make sure that we were covering everyone. Um, if the Office of Law or any of my colleagues on the council or the administration have a suggestion of how we can open that wider to ensure that we're covering the landlords um, as well as the tenants and make sure that everybody is included in there, if we need to add some language, very open to having that conversation. This is what we put together in working through this with the Office of Law, understanding the intention was to cover both owned and leased premises. So if the Office of Law tells me that we now need to add something that in our previous discussions was not brought up, uh, then we certainly can look to do that. And I would appreciate that amendment. Does anyone have any other comments or questions? Okay, seeing and hearing none. Thank you all for uh, being available this morning for discussing Bill 7621. Have a great day. And we will move on to the last item on our agenda, which is resolution number 4121. Mr. Barron. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, glad to see we're at the end of the, the morning. Um, Pete Barron with the administration. Uh, from Central Services, I have uh, Mr. Daniels and Ms. Anderson. From DPW, I have uh, Mr. Phipps. And from Law, Ms. Niederer. Um, resolution 4121 uh, will um, allow the county um, to take ownership of the what is commonly referred to as the Hein Brothers building. Um, it took me, I think, a uh, uh, quite a while to realize, um, and I hope um, to make sure it's clear, there are a couple of buildings that are colloquially known as the Heim Brothers building. Uh, this is not the building uh, that OEM is in, right at the Glen Burnie Town uh, Center. This is off of Crane Highway, um, right by Empire Towers. Um, you've probably driven past it a, a hundred times. It's where aging and disability and OIT um, have some offices. We have been renting uh, this building. The county has the right of first refusal. The owners are looking to sell. Um, we, we think it would be a, a smart fiscal investment to purchase the property. Uh, doing so would, um, reduce, would reduce our county operating expenditure by about $13,000 each month. Um, the county is purchasing this property for uh, $2 million. It's 16,000 square feet um, and uh, houses some very important county services and we would like to keep the building. Um, so with that, happy to answer any questions and uh, look forward uh, to the uh, council approving this resolution. Um, and I'm blanking if it's up on the 20th or on uh, October 4th, but I will look that up real quick. <laughs> Thank you. I have a quick question first of just, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the building? How old is it? And uh, when, you know, when is about the next time that we would expect that it might need any kind of renovations or other capital investment? Our central services and DPW folks are probably the best to, to answer that. So Ms. Anderson, maybe you can lead us off there. Absolutely. Christine Anderson, director of the Office of Central Services. Uh, I don't know the exact age of the building. It's about, uh, it was built, I believe, in the 80s. So it would need some maintenance coming up. However, the way that the lease was structured, we already had been doing um, some of those maintenance activities, including um, HVAC and some other interior things. So. Um, taking on the renovations or the needed investments is seems to us to be more prudent than continuing to pay rent um, for a building that we really have no intention of leaving. Um, so that's, I don't have the exact numbers for you, but we have been bearing some of the cost already. Okay, we have a few questions. Ms. Fiedler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Amanda Fiedler, District 5. 
Is the entire building occupied by county agencies? Uh, Christine Anderson, Office of Central Services. Yes. Thank you. Um, Ms. Hare. Thank you, Madam Chair. Jessica Hare, District 7. Do I understand correctly that we're paying a bit above the appraisal? Christine Anderson, Office of Central Services. Um, I'm going to ask Chris Daniels to explain why we're paying just a, a little bit more than the appraisal. Chris? This is Chris, Chris Daniels, Real Estate Manager, Office of Central Services. Uh, the appraisal uh, that was done in July 2020 did value the property at $1,950,000, but that was actually based on the 2020 uh, rents. The rents actually increased a little bit in 2021. And if I apply the same cap rate that the appraiser used, um, I come up with a uh, slightly higher value uh, for the building than uh, $2 million. Okay. Mr. Volke. Thank you, Madam Chair. Nathan Volke, District 3. So I work with Treffer um, from time to time in my private business to value real property. So I know them and I know the way that they do their appraisals. And it looks like their appraisal last April came in at 1.5. 152. So I guess if we're talking about having old appraisals and we're paying over market value, why didn't we go out and just get a new appraisal? Mr. Barron, who would you like to answer that question? I think it's probably best for Ms. Anderson to direct us if <laughs> uh, she's the right person to answer. Thank you. Christine Anderson, Office of Central Services. Uh, we could go out and get updated appraisals, but based on our internal knowledge and looking at those appraisals, there are some differences in what they look at. Um, I have learned in my time uh, working on county real estate issues that appraisers never agree. They always have some different way of calculating things, some different calculation to include. Um, we felt that $2 million was a fair value for the building for what we were getting, what we, what we needed in that area. Um, the building, they did have another um, another bid potentially, so we were not interested in getting into a bidding situation. We had the right of first refusal. We made what we felt was a very fair offer, um, particularly once it was updated for the current the rents that were actually being paid and what the landlord likely would have earned. So we felt the $2 million was a fair offer. Mr. Volke? Thank you, Madam Chair. Nathan Volke, District 3. So I remember this building, this is the old Board of Elections building. I remember going up there and filing my candidacy 2010, 2014. I remember when the Board of Elections moved out and went over to Ordnance Road because they needed a lot more space and this building was too small. Um, I remember that this building has itty bitty stairways. I remember that, I can't remember if there are elevators. Are there elevators in the building? There are, okay. I was gonna ask you about if there were any ADA compliance issues you were gonna have to get into because I remember there are like some narrow hallways and, and there are maybe some access issues. Um, but I guess my, my key question is this, I'm averaging out the appraisals in the resolution. It talks about 1.5 was the Treffer appraisal and it looks like 1.82 was the Weinhold group. The average is 1.67. Um, I guess I'm just, I'm trying, I'm still just grappling with this idea that we're, we don't know what the other bid was, right? Christine Anderson. No, we do not know what the other bid was. Okay. So we're spending taxpayer money without knowing what the other bid was, assuming that it could potentially have been higher than our bid when our own appraisals 18 months ago said that the average value of this property was like 1.67 and we're, you know, three and, and some change over top of that. I get, I'm just I'm not clear on why we're not getting another appraisal. That's where I think I'm struggling. Christine Anderson, Office of Central Services. Um, on the ADA questions first, uh, the Department of Aging and Disabilities is currently in that building and they are very keen to make sure that if they're gonna run a Northern Service Center that they're um, most likely the folks to come see them have access. So yes, there is an elevator in that building. Um, uh, and, and also they tend to hold their bigger meetings and things more of their um, outreach activities on the first floor to just make it easier for people to transit. 
Um, the building also features a loading bay, which is unique in that area. It actually has large roll-up doors. That was very useful for the elections board when they were there, but the Office of Information Technology also uses that, um, that space for project management for a couple of large uh, IT projects they're running, and that, that space is invaluable, frankly. Um, to try to lease a small bit of warehouse space anywhere in that vicinity would be almost impossible because typically landlords would want you to take much larger space. Uh, so as to the appraisals, um, for us, the appraisals are a guide. They are not hard and fast as, a, um, as you know, their only true measure of a value of a building is what it's actually going to sell for. Um, we also had a situation where while we had the right of first refusal, there was a bona fide offer on the table so we did have to match that, and we did not feel that the offer that was on the table um, that we wanted to offer, the $2 million, which was a slightly above that appraisal, appraisal amount, as you said, that Chris mentioned had been updated, we felt that $2 million was a legitimate offer, and the, the seller accepted it. We don't know what the outside offer was, what that third offer was, but we felt that, or I don't know, uh, but the we felt that that $2 million was a good fair price for this building that is valuable to us in terms of the services that we provide in North County. Mr. Prusky. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think the question was answered, but I wanna follow up in, uh, Councilman Andrew Prusky, District 4. Um, so you did make an attempt to look at other uh, facilities or other things in the area. I just wanted to make sure that that was addressed because obviously uh, there are a lot of vacant buildings right now and there are looking people to sell as well with the current market. So I just want to make sure for the public record that that's something that the administration did. Christine Anderson, Office of Central Services. Yes, we worked with our brokers and tried to find space that is similar to this in the location that would work as well. And while there is vacancies in the area, it is not similar to this kind of property with the kind of access that it offers near a bus line with that nice loading bay, which was useful for OIT and their projects, um, access from both Crane Highway and Ritchie Highway. It's uniquely situated and we felt that it was important to, and it had sufficient space at a good price. Uh, so we felt like it was important to purchase the property and stop paying rent there. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question um, from Ms. Anderson. Have you, or could you give a, a ballpark of what it would cost to, uh, you know, if, if the county doesn't purchase this building, then you have to move the services out of that building. What would be the cost of relocating? Christine Anderson, Office of Central Services. I have not looked at that, what the cost would be. Um, we would probably have to make some decisions about where could, maybe we wouldn't have a certain Northern Service Center for aging and disabilities. Um, maybe the people would then just have to go back to the Annapolis area to get those services. Maybe we couldn't replace it. Uh, what would OIT do in terms of managing their projects and the storage that they need? So I, we haven't looked at it. I couldn't even begin to hazard a guess of what the cost might be. Um, I would just like to not do it if possible. We'd like to buy the building. <laughs> Well, given that moving is hell, no matter who's doing the moving, <laughs> um, but also that we, uh, as I recall, have um, a higher proportion of our aging population in the northern part of the county, and that uh, I think no one would really want the idea of decreasing the availability of services to that population in the northern part of the county. So um, that's useful to think about. Um, Mr. Volke. Thank you, Madam Chair. I promise this will be my last round of questions. Um, so I just, I, I wanna understand the other assets that we own in the area. I know that we have over on BNA Boulevard, the big property that used to be the Board of Elections too, at one point in time, um, that's back there. What, if any plans do we have for that? And could that potentially do the same thing? I know over on Langley, we've got the health office that's over there. Um, so it's not like we don't have any assets in this part of the county. So I guess I'm just curious, like, I know that we want to acquire this building. I understand we want to purchase it. I just want to know, have we looked at the other assets we already own to see if they could do the same thing that we're talking about here? Um, I'll let Ms. Anderson uh, answer that. Again, I think she mentioned before um, that they did do a thorough review. So Ms. Anderson? Sure, Christine Anderson, Office of Central Services. We do have several properties up in the Glen Burnie area. As you know, we uh, own the Arundel Center North, which is largely used by the community college and controlled for their use. 
Uh, we own the Hind Building, not the Hind Brothers Building, but the Hind Building, which is where the Office of Emergency Management is. Um, across the street, we own the Robinson Building, which um, currently houses the Office of State's Attorney. That is very location specific. Uh, the attorneys really would like to be in the courthouse, so being across the street and down the block a little bit, it's probably a little bit further away than they would like. Uh, Langley Road is actually leased, so the health center there is in leased property. Uh, we are in leased property on Aquahart. The elections board, as you know, is up off Bay Meadow in a facility there, so that is leased. Um, I am sure that I am forgetting a couple of them. The largest one is 7409 B&A Boulevard. Um, as you mentioned, that is a large piece of property there, and the administration is undertaking a project to look at the best uses for that going forward. Um, and we hope to have something exciting to announce soon. Um, but right now it is used by at least one nonprofit. The county um, northern garage uh, has a fleet operation there, and the police have some um, storage there. Uh, we also, the front building is used by the Office of Transportation, as well as the Partnership for Children and Families and archaeology also has something stored there. So that property is fully used and would not have been an option for moving these functions there um, at, in a timeline that would have met uh, potentially the sale of this building. Mr. Volke? Just a follow-up. So uh, the, the property on B&A Boulevard, I think that was rezoned to mixed use in the GDP. Is that right? Uh, we actually, I just had a conversation with planning and zoning about that yesterday. I don't believe that is true. I believe that okay. it is actually R5, okay. uh, but we are looking into that and having some internal conversations about that. It's R5 and OS because of the floodplain. And is there any discussion with that property of surplusing it, or is the county going to retain that as an asset? It's always oh. discussion. Yes, yeah, so there's always discussion, um, and it's to my knowledge we are going to retain it at this time. Got it. Okay, thank you. Mr. Volke, just as a reminder, Plan 2040 did not rezone any property. Reclassify. I should have said reclassify. Anyone else have any questions on resolution number 4121? Hearing and seeing none. We've reached the end of our agenda for today. Thank you for, to everyone for making the time to be here and participate. The County Council will be back in session at 7 p.m. on September 20th, 2021. Have a great day.